Well, hello, everybody. Um, there's quite a few people joining us already. Um, welcome to the latest uh, webinar in the series from B First to BSSH. Um, we've been running this for almost a year now, almost each month. This particular webinar, the theme is imaging. So we're going to start basically with x-rays and then move on to other modalities of imaging. So hopefully by the end of the meeting, you'll have a fair idea, maybe a slightly uh, different ways of looking at things and analyzing the x-rays that we deal with every day. So to begin with, um, th this is a relatively simple format of the webinar. We've got a series of talks. At the end of most of the talks, there are a couple of sort of cases just to look at and discuss. Um, some we might have poll questions for, but if you want to answer the questions or just think about them for a few seconds, then the answers will be given to you in real time. Okay. Um, there will be a, attendance certificates given out and you get CME points for watching it as long as you stay to, to the end. Um, we can tell, the technology will tell us. And they will be sent out in, in the next week or two. Okay. Um, if you do want to ask questions or comment, please use the Q&A function. We will have someone monitoring that. Um, comments in the chat may get, may get lost. Okay. So I say this is part of an ongoing series. There will be another one in about a month's time, um, in fact, the 30th of April, and that's on median and other nerve problems. Right. So to kick it off, I'm going to just start. Right. As a starter, I just want to make a few comments about some of the basic concepts um, that you might think about when we're looking at x-rays of the hand and, and the wrist. So essentially, when we look at x-rays, we're indulging in a process of pattern recognition. We look at an x-ray, we recognize what it should be like, so we need to know what's normal, and then we identify what's different from the normal. So to know what's normal, you have to know your anatomy. Almost every teaching session we do, we go on, go back to the anatomy. You can't interpret any sort of imaging unless you have a really good idea and knowledge of what the anatomy of the hand and wrist is supposed to look like. I won't go any further, but you know all this stuff. So this is a radiograph of a normal wrist, the lateral and the PA. Now, a lot of people refer to this as an AP x-ray. Technically, it's actually a PA x-ray, and we all know what it normal looks like. Occasionally, we see something that just doesn't look right. It can be difficult on the first inspection to know exactly what's going on here, but it's clear it's not normal. If it looks wrong, it probably is wrong. There's something going on. If you take the other, look at the other x-ray closely, then it's clear what's going on. There's a capitate dislocated from the, from the bleeding. But the x-rays don't just show what's happened recently. There are often clues as to other things that have happened in the patient's life. This is a cat that belongs to one of my colleagues who was run over by a car a couple of years ago and has lots of different operations. So don't just concentrate on the obvious injury. Try and look for other clues of what's going on in the rest of the x-ray. Now, most of the patients think we take an x-ray of the bone to see whether it's broken or not. We certainly want some questions asked and answered. But I would put it to you that the question that we as hand surgeons need to be answered isn't whether it's broken or not, that's often quite obvious, it's whether we have to do something about it. So when I look at an x-ray, in my mind, I'm going through a whole series of binary questions, yes, no. Is it broken? Yes, no, as I say, that's often obvious. Is it displaced? I might have to do something about that. Does it, if it's displaced, does it need to be reduced? How am I going to do that? Is it stable? Once I've reduced it, how do I make it stay there? Does it involve the joint? I might have implications for the future. So, can you see the break here? There is actually one. There's a tiny fracture there, but it's completely undisplaced, completely stable, doesn't need anything doing about it. We can stop worrying about that, send the patient away. There's a clear break here, but do we need to do anything about it? 
the elasticity of someone caused by trouble. This fracture, this is actually part of the scaphoid, is completely displaced. The scaphoids come out the back, the lunettes come out the front. You clearly can't see that. You leave that alone. That needs reducing. That needs something done about it. It's stable. This is, this is quite an easy fracture to reduce. You just pull on it, but it won't stay where it is when, after you've done that. You need to do something to hold it there. Cross KY is a good way of doing that. This can be a trap for you. If you look at that x ray, it might look as if that's not particularly displaced. But if you took a, an x ray of a fracture like that from the lateral aspect, you might see a much more angulation than you might think. These are big fractures. Again, it might look fairly well aligned on one x ray, but these often rotate. Sometimes you can't see that well on, on radiographs. So as well as looking at radiographs, you do have to remember you still have to examine the patient and that can be the only way to look at rotational stability. Does it involve the joint? If you leave the joint dislocated and fractured like that, that clearly is going to go on, cause trouble in the future. Simple to reduce it. So if it involves the joint, you know you might have problems if you don't deal with that in the future. So to recognize these things, you need good radiographs, like radiographs that are consistent. Okay. Like I say, most x-rays are actually PA and the lateral at 90 degrees. These need to be accurate, otherwise you get oblique views, which are just harder to interpret. Someone came up with rule of twos. Always have two views, two joints above and below the bit you're interested in. If you're uncertain, Two limbs, I create the other side. Beware of two injuries. And if you're not really sure what's going on, repeat the x ray. Do two x rays. Two views. Everyone will stare at this rather nasty looking wrist fracture. Did you all spot the scaphoid fracture? Fortunately, my colleagues did and they fixed it. X rays also tell us things about the soft tissues. In itself, this little flake of the triquetrum isn't much of an issue, but it's actually an indicator of quite a significant soft tissue injury and wrist capsule sprain. And that's the injury that will cause the patient trouble rather than the flake of bone off the triquetrum. Again, an intraarticular fracture. This is likely to cause problems with this joint in the future if nothing's done about it. So the future can be predicted to a certain extent from what the x-ray show. This definitely will cause problems. Leaders ask questions, do we need to interfere with this? Even that. So in summary, x-rays are very useful. They can help you decide what to do. They can warn you what not to do. Possibly they predict the future. But remember, you can't just rely on imaging. We still got to have a basic examination, be able to examine the hand, but get used to looking at normal x-rays. The more normal x-rays you look at, the more you'll spot abnormalities. Anatomy is the key as an x-ray, a radiograph. It's simply a shadow of the normal anatomy on a plate. So thank you. Right. Now, we're very lucky to have um, uh, colleagues from Sri Lanka, from the Sri Lankan Orthopedic Cancer Society. Sorry, that was my last talk. The Sri Lankan Society for Surgery of the Hand. So I'd like, first of all, for them to introduce themselves. Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Disanayaka. And we've also got with us Dr. Melanie Amarasuruya, who's going to be talking later on in the program. And uh, Jeremy, you'd introduce yourself. Uh, hi there. Yeah, I'm Jeremy Stanton. I'm an upper limb surgeon, hands and shoulders in Colchester in Essex in the UK, not that far from where Martin works in Bury St Edmunds. And I've done a few of these things and been out to Malawi a couple of times with Martin from the BSSH. And Elliot? Hi, uh, yes, um, Elliot Rees. I'm a radiology consultant based in uh, West Suffolk. Uh, work with Martin. Um, Melanie, can you say where you, you are at the moment? Hi, I'm Melanie. I'm uh, trained in Sri Lanka, currently in Adelaide doing a PhD. So 
yeah, basically I'm Sri Lankan hand surgeon, but currently in Adelaide, Australia. And we have a couple of other colleagues, Alex and Katie, behind the scenes monitoring the chat and everything. And we've got a, a lovely recorded video from one of our uh, musculoskeletal um, ultrasonographer colleagues later on in the program. So having started off, uh, if we carry on with our next talk, Dr. Demica is going to tell us I, directed directly at Elliot what we expect from radiologists. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm trying to share the screen. So um, good afternoon to everybody in UK and greetings from Sri Lanka. Um, I thank you for granting me this opportunity to take part in this uh, interesting webinar. Um, yeah, um, are you seeing my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes. All good. Yes. Carry on, please. Ah, uh, yeah. And yeah. So my uh, topic would be what hand surgeons want or expect from radiologists. Mm, but I often uh, wonder: Do we hand surgeons and radiologists speak the same language? I'm not talking about English or French or German or Japanese. Well, you know what I mean. Yeah. So what do we have in common? After all, we are all doctors or medical professionals. So does the similarity end there? No. <laughs> don't, don't take my remarks as an insult, especially the radiologists in, the, uh, in here. <laughs> audience. This is just a uh, just frank and friendly discussion. So this is the starter. Now I um, requested the PA and lateral views of the wrist, but this is what I got. Mm. Yeah, so this is obviously not a lateral X-ray. So I had to turn the patient back to get, uh, get this one, proper lateral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I believe uh, it's um, unfair by the patient as well as the surgeon having to send the patient back again. So I think I think this is partly actually the fault, uh, shall I say, of the radiographer, but then um, they are under the radiologist's uh, guidance, I suppose. So I would like uh, the x-rays being taken exactly the way I request. I'm sure most of the other uh, hand surgeons also would feel the same way. Um, and I don't like surprises when I ask for a lateral to get an um, oblique or something like that. Also, one of, um, as um, Martin already uh, spoke about, I would like correct exposure or the, the correct penetration. Being I, I, Actually, I am a hobbyist um, photographer as well. So, I am very much uh, aware of uh, this problem with you know exposure as to how it affects the quality of the radiograph and our ability to interpret you know fine fractures like say hairline or, or undisplaced fractures and so on. Let's look at a few more examples. Uh, this is a teenage girl with a circumferential lump involving, involving the dominant index. And she noticed painless progressive enlargement for a couple of years. Um, so this is not about X-ray actually, this is about uh, MRI, uh, still it's imaging. So uh, you can clearly see the, the 
enhanced images after this contrast MRI. That's fine. You know, all these images look very nice. But uh, um, I had to you know, disclose the, this is the top part of the report because I want to take into consideration the age, uh, you know, for you to know that it's a, it's a young one. Um, yeah. Uh, now, uh, I cannot quite understand uh, this highlighted part, you know, like it says uh, dorsal, uh, it's, it's on the dorsal aspect and it extends laterally. Um, and also it says it goes under the flexor tendon of the finger. That's something, you know, that I cannot understand, you know, like I cannot uh, like uh, envision it. I cannot uh, imagine, you know, or make a mental picture, you know, which is important for a surgeon to plan the surgery, to be able to imagine you know, what it exactly is. True that there are films, but then I tend to rely a lot on the printed stuff or the stuff on, online. Um, and the other two uh, issues are with uh, the differential diagnosis in this uh, condition. Well, let's talk about it in detail. Now, it's, I think, about uh, precision of uh, reporting, also logical reasoning behind the differential diagnosis that uh, arrived at. So this is why I would like uh, the descriptive terms radial ulna dorsal vola in case of any hand uh, radiograph or any other imaging technique or for that matter even clinical examination and not things like uh, medial and lateral and anterior and posterior they don't mean much uh, because there are specific terms uh, as i mentioned and the exact tissue plane in which this you now in the case of a lump where exactly it is the depth from the skin surface exactly in millimeters in the hand of course millimeters in other places maybe centimeters and accurate dimensions also the relationship of the lump to the neurovascular structures whether it's just a butting on or pushing it away or invading or encircling and so on same with the tendons and bones the same 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 things so let's uh, yeah now now here uh, what i mean is now differential diagnosis is a good thing uh, compared to maybe one diagnosis most of the time it's good to be differential diagnosis rather than single diagnosis so it should be, I suppose, um, in the order of probability based on radiological as well as clinical findings, which means I think uh, I don't know whether it's customary for radiologists in UK to examine the patient. I suppose it's a very good thing to do, you know, preoperatively uh, the radiologists to examine, you know, before before the imaging actually. So back to the same one again. Now, um, if we apply those uh, principles uh, which I mentioned, or oh, oh, the, the 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 suggestions, I don't know whether glomus tumor come. I'm not criticizing this report, but then I'm talking about the precision and the logical reasoning. Glomus tumor, whether it comes into the picture at all, or whether whether it's it's at the top, you know. I mean, certainly. And synovial sarcoma in uh, this 12 year old. So, my working diagnosis actually, this patient was sent to me uh, with, uh, with all these reports. But my, uh, my tentative diagnosis was a vascular anomaly because, I mean, for me, uh, synovial sarcoma or glomus tumor was not on the cards for this child. And the MRI, um, shows uh, quite good enhancement i think i don't know much about radiology but these i'm talking from the point of view of a surgeon a hand surgeon 
So these are little things. Yeah, now this is also a different sort of imaging um, as opposed to a plain radiograph. Um, yeah, this is the patient who lost the fingertip. Um, yeah, and the bone is exposed. So I was planning to do this flap. So I'm a hand surgeon who was train more in line with plastic surgery, you know, so I like these little flaps. As, and the patient uh, doesn't want to shorten the digit anymore. So for this, to be certain about uh, the distal circulation, um, the arches of the arteries, I wanted this uh, image of the arteriogram to be reported uh, in such a way that uh, my fear is gone you know like uh, if the reporting says there's continuity between the radial and um, ulnar sided digital arteries i would have been very happy but it wasn't uh, reported that way. anyway i did this and luckily succeeded yeah so i would have loved to now, um, I, I would have loved to read the report. It should have uh, mentioned that there is continuity, you know, between the two um, sets of arteries. Yes. Yeah, it's it's this continuity, and also about the arcades. I don't know whether it's technically extremely difficult. Uh, to comment on this, but that's the purpose of my getting the test done. It's it's not a like simple test, I know. But then I uh, I wanted to uh, save the you know save the finger which the patient wanted. So this is my hand surgeon's point of view. So to conclude. Yeah, um, hand surgeons, I suppose everyone of us wants uh, radiologists to earnestly help them by complying with the exact use of x-rays uh, as requested. Um, yeah, so if, uh, if it's a kind of standing order to the radiographers, I suppose it would work that way. Um, also, providing the right information in the radiology report, be it um, MRI, CT, arteriogram, or plane radiograph, or anything else, that facilitates um, the surgeon's access to the pathology. So it should contain um, adequate information that helps the surgeon quickly access, you know, like uh, the pathology make the dissection very quick um, and prevents um, us from deviating or digressing into wrong tissue planes and uh, also avoid uh, surgical mishaps and allow completion of the job quickly. Um, now, the information, um, I, I depend so much on uh, radiology um, reports and then after the um, excision biopsies on the pathologies uh, or incision biopsies on the pathologist reports. So I cannot like um, live without them. So I want them to be as uh, perfect as possible, especially allowing me to, you know, access the lesion, you know, that that, that needs a lot of information in the report. Uh, I think one A4 page full report would, uh, would do well, <laughs> you know, I don't know whether everybody will agree with me. I, I don't like, you know, like half a page reports generally, unless there's, a, the, unless it's a new normal one, normal, normal report, you don't have to write so much, I suppose. And then it makes um, dissection a lot easier, a lot easier. Um, in, in cases where these things were not uh, 
very well mentioned. Uh, we have, or at least I have, uh, gone in wrong tissue planes and struggled uh, to reach the pathology and dissect it and done surgical blunders. You know, if uh, there is no proper mentioning about neurovascular structures, how they are trapped in the lump and so on. And uh, yeah, this applies to X-rays as you know, I'm mainly talking about higher level of investigations, but X-rays uh, coming, as I was mentioning, without uh, proper exposure and proper waves and so on, you know, they won't help us much. Um, and uh, now if the X-ray is uh, not good enough, my uh, reflex is to order a CT scan. So to economize on, on investigations, I suppose it's a good idea to, you know, like have uh, fantastic digital X-rays that would at least uh, do away with uh, some of the CT scans uh, that are requested. I don't know whether you will agree. Yes. So this is how to reach me if you, in case you know you want to, you know, reach me. You know, two email addresses, and I am on LinkedIn and Instagram, Facebook. Instagram because I am a photographer, so some of my nature photos, travel photos are there. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Dr. Danica, well, thank you very much for that talk. It's that's quite challenging. It really makes me think of how things used to be in the UK quite a few years ago. And it makes me realise how privileged we are now to work so much more closely with the, the X-ray department than we used to. For example, Elliot and our, our upper limb colleagues, every month or more often than that, we have an MDT meeting. And exactly the sort of things you've discussed, we, we sit down with them and say, this is what we're actually planning to do. And this is the information we want from you. And this concept of actually talking to your radiologist is so, so important to get over all these problems that you've, you've just mentioned there. Um, Elliot, what, what would you, you comment? Yeah, I think you're right. It's that, um, it's that conversation, isn't it, really? Um, I think it's easier to have in person or, you know, at least through a video chat. Um, things are very easily misconstrued through messaging and emails. So, um, yeah, absolutely, just uh, reach out. I think the other difficulty sometimes is that you don't have a subspecialist radiologist who has an interest in MSK so or vascular for that, for that vascular case you have. So they're always going to be on, 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 on to a, onto a loser there um, unless you do have someone who's trained to, to look at the specific things you want, want to look at. But, um, yeah, some That's interesting right. points raised. So That's right. I like think subspecialist radiology uh, is a is a way is the way forward. I suppose yes. Because sometimes uh, from a general radiologist, we won't get as complete a report as uh, subspecialists would give. Yeah. So sometimes our hopes and ideas of what you can image possibly is a little bit over over ambitious. Again, that's really helpful if we actually sit down. Can you show us something like that? And you. Kind of actually, no, it's too small, or it's there's no way of seeing this. You've just got to open it up and find out. But yeah, I would thoroughly recommend setting up regular MDTs if you can, if you've got that opportunity. Anyone else want to make any comments? Yeah, um, sorry, it's Jeremy Stanton here. There are, I mean, I, it's reassuring that um, issues with regards to perhaps inadequate views are worldwide. So it's not just me being picked on. And, and I think it's, um, I think it is it is a common issue. There, there are a couple of situations that um, I always um, ask for X-rays with slight dread because they're often wrong, actually not because it's not a true lateral. And I can tell you, one of the ones I wonder whether you've had the same experience is if you're doing an ulnar shortening and you want to know whether or not your ulna has united. They will give you an AP and they'll give you a true lateral, but unfortunately the lateral they take is rotating the radius around the ulna. So actually the picture you get is exactly the same view of the ulna and you can't see whether the osteotomy is healed. So they need to rotate the, um, the plate, not the wrist. Um, and actually for 20 years, you have to retrain people. You have to go through the same issue 
time and time again that actually, you know, a, a lateral view of the wrist, it may give you a lateral view of the radius, it does not give you a lateral view of the ulna. So that's one issue that I have not infrequently. The other thing is the number of missed fourth and fifth CMC joint dislocations we have had at Colchester because what is looked at um, um, in A&E is an AP view and an oblique or oblique-ish view. So those are two particular situations where, you know, the true lateral is really essential. And actually, as you showed on your pictures, Martin, which will be fairly similar to the ones I'm about to show, um, uh, you know, the, the oblique views of uh, an IP joint, you really can't assess displacement of condyles well enough. I would concur with many of those points. Taking thumb x-rays, the base of thumb arthritis before the myelitis bug bears. I'd, I'd encourage you to go and speak to the radiographers as well and to actually sit with them when they're x-raying because I'm sure you could teach them a lot about exactly the kind of views you want if there are specialist views in that sort of ulnar shortening procedure that you 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 know you, you describe. I think um, having an, an, an orthopod there for sure to, to guide the radiographers is really beneficial for the patients and avoids a lot of recalls and unnecessary imaging. It is when we're not exactly clear what we want. We sort of assume that if we say something, it's absolutely clear and people will know exactly what we want, but not always. Great. Okay, well, shall we carry on? So now Jeremy's taken the floor. Would you like to carry on with your talk? You've gone uh, Emma, you're, you're going to, because it's, it's on, I've done a recording, actually. So I, I think, Emma, you're going to play the recording. Is that right? Recording. I will. And I will yeah, that's correct. Can you all see that? Yes. Yep. Okay. I'll hit play. Unless you have an introduction to do, Jeremy, or shall I just go for it? Uh, well, no, this is just a talk I recorded yesterday, but I am here in person as well. Great. Thank you. In this talk, I'm going to be discussing the radiology of fractures of the hand, specifically metacarpals and phalanges to see how the morphology of the fracture is related to the mechanism of injury, and also to get an idea from the fracture pattern, what sort of treatment is required for the fracture, whether it needs to be conservative or whether it needs to be um, surgical. The bones and joints of the hand only represent one of the five layers of the anatomy of the hand. Radiographs can therefore only act as one of the tools to aid um, treatment and clin clinical examination in concert with um, assessment of the radiographs is essential. This talk will be restricted to discussing the fractures of the tubular bones of the hand and also the dislocations between these tubular bones and between the metacarpals and the carpal bones. Accurate assessment of bony injury um, is fundamentally predicated um, on having good x-rays uh, to start off with. The severity of fracture subluxations can often be underestimated with oblique laterals and patients do from time to time require sending back to the x-ray department in order to get better imaging, particularly the true lateral. Getting consistent views with consistent exposure and penetration makes it much easier to detect sometimes subtle abnormalities. The rule of twos is well established um, in radiology with two views perpendicular to each other being fundamental, um, looking at the joints above and below any injury, sometimes looking at the similar joint um, on the other side for comparison, um, to um, rule out any other injuries in addition to the primary injury, and to monitor injuries in a temporal fashion um, to ensure that there's no further displacement. As with the interpretation of um, x-rays of any part of the body there is no substitute for the experience of having looked at a number of normal x-rays um, a good knowledge of the normal alignment of both phalanges and metacarpals will immediately highlight when things simply just don't look quite right without a thorough knowledge of the bony and ligamentous anatomy of the fingers the clinical significance of any injury seen may be very difficult to assess if a fracture is seen, it is essential to have a reliable system with which to describe the fracture, looking specifically at the site, configuration and displacement of the fracture. This is um, um, vital really for three reasons. Firstly, in order to communicate both with the patient and other clinicians about the nature of the fracture. 
secondly, in order to guide further treatment, and thirdly, to give some of prognosis um, with regards to the final outcome of the fracture. Fracture displacement can be described according to its angulation and translation, but also clinically on its rotation. Um, as we've described previously, rotation actually can be quite difficult to um, quantify based on a plain x-ray. The phalanges and metacarpals are typical long bones with an epiphysis at either end, the shaft of the bone or diaphysis, with the metaphysis representing the transition zone between, between diaphysis and metaphysis. The head of the phalanges um, consists of ulnar and radial condyles, with the base of the bone having, an ul having both an ulnar and radial side. The anatomy of the soft tissues of the IP joints and the MCP joints is of the form of a three-sided box deficient dorsally. The radial and ulnar sides of this box are made up of the true and accessory collateral ligaments and the volar aspect of the box is made up of the volar plate. This deficiency dorsally is why dorsal dislocations of these joints are much more common than volar. When volar dislocations of the PIP joint do occur, it's essential to assess for integrity of the central slip of the extensor tendons in order to prevent the onset of a boutonniere deformity. Once the fracture has been diagnosed and described in terms of its site configuration and displacement, three further things need to be assessed. Firstly, does it involve the joint? Secondly, is the position acceptable or does it need reduction? And thirdly, even if the position is acceptable, is the fracture stable or likely to displace further? Most fractures, if, clinical, if clinically significant, are actually fairly obvious when you um, look at the x-rays. In this particular um, x-ray, there is actually a fracture of the fourth metacarpal, not visible at all on the AP, but just about visible on the lateral. Obviously, clinical examination is um, essential to look for any uh, rotational deformity. These fractures are obvious, a transverse fracture on the left and an oblique extraarticular fracture on the right. The oblique fracture on the right is more likely to shorten than the one on the left because of the inherent tension of the extrinsic flexors and extensors. Both of these injuries require uh, reduction. It's perhaps more obvious in the right-hand image with the typical dorsal dislocation of the PIP joint, but on the left-hand image, it's evident that this is a subluxation, in fact a fracture subluxation, uh, rather than a true dislocation. It's often very helpful to draw a line tangentially to the dorsal cortex of the proximal phalanx. It is clear that the base of the middle phalanx is lying dorsal to this line, and therefore the joint is incongruent, requiring surgery. The malalignment of a fracture can be either valgus varus, flexion extension, or um, in the rotational plane. Uh, in this fracture, we see um, significant ulnar angulation of a Salter Harris II type fracture of the proximal phalanx of the little finger. Uh, clearly, there is obvious there will be obvious clinical deformity here. Here we see an obvious dorsal angulation of a fracture of the mid shaft of the proximal phalanx. In other words, with the apex of the fracture in, 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 volarly. Dorsal um, angulation is the more common pattern of angulation, particularly in fractures at the basal metaphyseal region of the proximal phalanx because of the balance of the extensors and flexors. Here we see a volarly angulated fracture through the shaft of the first metacarpal. In fact, in the first metacarpal, volar angulation, i.e. apex dorsally, is the more common um, fracture alignment. Clinically, due to the mobility of the first CMC joint, quite a bit of angulation can be, can be accepted in the first metacarpal without um, surgery being required. Here we see a dislocation of the um, proximal phalanx um, in, the more common dorsal dis in the more common dorsal direction, um, as previously discussed, due to the relative deficiency of the stabilizing box of soft tissue around the um, PIP joint. Here we see a rather less common volar dislocation of the PIP joint with no obvious bony avulsion injury from the dorsal base of the middle phalanx. Nevertheless, um, integrity of the central slip of the extensors does need to be tested for upon reduction of this dislocation. This image shows a volar fracture subluxation of the proximal interphalangeal joint. In fact, this represents more than just a central slip avulsion as there is a pilon stroke crush element to the um, injury to the 
um, dorsal base of the middle of the middle phalanx, and this represents quite a significant injury. Whatever the method of fixation, this is going to result in some stiffness of the PIP joint in the long term. The left-hand radiograph demonstrates quite significant ulnar displacement of the head of the index finger metacarpal, a Salter Harris II type fracture. The uh, middle and ring finger metacarpals are also displaced somewhat ulnarly. Although I've already said that x-ray interpretation also relies on clinical examination, there are also times when clinical examination also requires radiological investigation. This is a patient I only saw last week in fracture clinic, a 28-year-old soldier who injured his right little finger PIP joint um, some two months before and was actually examined by the army medics the day after, but as there was no clinical deformity, um, he wasn't x-rayed. Because, because he remained with pain and stiffness um, in the right little finger PIP joint, he then came to fracture clinic and x-rays revealed an obvious chronic dorsoulnar dislocation of the right uh, little finger PIP joint. There's already bony erosion seen at the volar base of the middle phalanx with calcification over the dorsum of the proximal phalanx and over the volar aspect of the middle phalanx. Um, close reduction here is clearly going to be completely impossible and indeed the outcome of chronic um, dislocations of the, P of the IP joints is often very unsatisfactory. Some 20 years ago we looked at about 700 metacarpal and phalangeal fractures in about 650 patients at the Pulvertaft hand unit in Derby. Looking at the hand at individual rays, almost 50% of cases of fractures and or dislocations involved the little finger, with 31% of all injuries involving the fifth metacarpal. Some 17% of all fractures seen in this series are fifth metacarpal neck fractures. Excluding the metacarpals, the little finger is still the most commonly affected at 31%, followed by the thumb at 24%, with the remaining digits approximately equally affected. It is clear that the border digits are more at risk than the um, index middle and ring fingers. In this series, the um, vast majority of, of cases were caused by either crush or direct injury, in fact over 80%. In this series, the most common fracture morphology was the oblique fracture, representing, representing some 38% of cases, followed by the transverse fracture, Epiphyseal fractures represented about 12% of cases. Shown here is a simple transverse fracture of the fourth metacarpal. These transverse fractures make up about one quarter of tubular bone fractures of the hand. Shown here is a typical oblique type, boxers type fracture. The commonest of all injuries that we saw during this study. Shown here is a spiral fracture of the fourth metacarpal. These injuries are deceptive in that although this looks to be in a good position, um, rotation is very hard to um, determine on a simple AP and lateral radiograph. These fractures were relatively um, rarely seen, representing only 6% of these of tubular bone fractures. Here is seen a longitudinal fracture of the little finger proximal phalanx. These are the most rarely seen fractures, representing only 3% of fractures. Epiphyseal fractures such as these, such as this Salter Harris type 2 fracture, were fairly commonly seen, indicative of the large number of children presenting to the Pulvertaft hand unit with, with finger injuries. These are the two most common avulsion type injuries that were seen. On the left hand side, a bony mallet type injury, and on the right, a volar plate avulsion type injury. Other avulsion injuries. Um, include the FDP avulsion type injuries um, as are seen on the right and left of these three images. This is one instance when the bigger the um, fragment of bone that's avulse, um, the potentially less serious the injury is in that the FDP um, cannot retract back through the sheath system. The middle image shows an avulsion injury at the base of the middle phalanx. This may result in some incompetence of the collateral ligaments and this obviously needs to be assessed clinically. This fracture represents a comminuted fracture of the um, neck stroke shaft of the fifth metacarpal, showing that boxer's fractures can range from fairly simple fractures to rather more complex. Seen here are multiple phalangeal fractures. About 6% of patients um, presenting with tubular bone fractures of the hand had um, multiple phalangeal fractures, had multiple tubular bone fractures. Seen here is an intraarticular fracture affecting the head of the middle phalanx. Intraarticular fractures represented 17% of um, all fractures presenting. Intraarticular fractures do more often 
require surgery in order to attain congruency of both the proximal and distal um, joint surfaces. Both of these injuries seen here involve uh, fracture subluxations and without reduction and some form of fixation the outcome for both of these injuries would be poor. Fracture subluxations at both the first CMC joint and the fifth CMC joint often do require um, operative intervention in terms of reduction plus some form of fixation in, in order to achieve congruency in the um, CMC joint. Oblique and spiral fractures are more likely to be longitudinally unstable due to the natural tension of the extrinsic uh, flexors and extensors and thus are more likely to require some form of uh, internal fixation. Classifying a fracture into whether the fracture is stable or unstable does not necessarily indicate that surgery is needed in an, in an unstable fracture. Minimally displaced unicondylar fractures or comminuted fractures which are undisplaced can be treated with um, splintage and careful um, follow-up in contrast to those unstable fractures with already unacceptable alignment either in terms of angulation or rotation which will need um, operative intervention. One of the main messages to take away from this talk is that it can be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to assess for rotational stability and deformity from um, a plain x-ray. Uh, looking at the radiograph on the left-hand side, actually, although comminuted, it looks relatively undisplaced. But the image on the right is the same finger, showing clear rotational deformity affecting the ring finger. Although neck fractures of the metacarpals, particularly the fifth metacarpal, represent a large proportion of these um, fractures, only a very small proportion of these fractures actually required surgery. On the other hand, head fractures of the proximal and middle phalanges, which were quite rarely seen, um, required surgery in up to 50% of the time. These head fractures were either uni or bicondylar fractures, often unstable and usually requiring internal fixation to prevent intraarticular incongruity. In conclusion, your ability to make an accurate assessment of um, radiographs of the hand is entirely dependent on being delivered accurate and consistent x-rays. There is no substitute for experience when it comes to looking at x-ray after x-ray after x-ray. You need to be comfortable with what is normal in order to make the detection of abnormal easier. Um, as already described, significant radiological abnormalities are usually easy to pick up but more subtle abnormalities are only um, revealed once you are comfortable with what normal looks like. Finally, accurate assessment of fractures of the hand are incomplete without clinical examination, particularly when it comes to looking for rotational abnormalities. Thank you very much. Right, well, um, I, that was a quick run through of uh, tubular bone fractures and dislocations. I, we have got three questions on a sort of a poll system that uh, I think Emma's going to bring up now that we can just play. Is that right, Emma? So basically, when you can see the um, x ray, and there are four choices, they're all true false questions. So you can see them, I can quickly read them out, that A, this is a potentially unstable fracture, true or false, B, the fracture is extra-articular, true or false, C, there's unlikely to be a clinical deformity, true or false, and D, DIP joint fusions often do badly. Now, there could be more than one true. Um, clearly, you probably know the answer to this one because you've seen the answer already, but um, I think you can do your poll now. So actually, on this one, just, just put the one down you think is true. Yes, yeah, so um, I think it's fairly clear. Most people got that right. We did say that these these um, intraarticular or certainly these um, oblique condylar fractures are often unstable um, because of the um, inherent tension in the flexors and extensors, the extrinsics, um, and these do often need fixation in order to achieve congruity in the head of the um, middle phalanx. So that is true. I mean, clearly it's intraarticular. 
Um, you can see just on the x-ray that it looks as though there is some clinical deformity. And actually, DIP, DIP joint fusions actually do pretty well. I mean, we do numbers of DIP joint fusions, certainly in the UK, for arthritis. And actually, I don't think there's a single DIP joint that doesn't fuse well. I mean, you may think that the index finger might be a problem, but even they do pretty nicely. So DIP joint fusions for um, bad outcome fractures or for um, primary osteoarthritis, I think, is a good operation. Okay, so let's go to the next question then. So these are two, these, you can see the two x-rays and um, well, the questions, I'll read them out. If left alone, both A and B will have the same clinical outcome. Question B, both A and B will require surgery. Um, question C, the mechanism of injury is usually a crush injury. And question D, mallet splints are often poorly applied. So one of those is correct. It'll be the same as last time. You'll get the pole and just put down the one you think is right. Okay, so um, actually the correct answer there is the is question D. Mallet splints are often poorly applied and uh, it's not that uncommon that I will see patients referred by from other fracture clinics, not necessarily an upper limb fracture clinic, where um, despite having their six weeks in a mallet splint, followed by two weeks nighttime only mallet splint, they have significant extensor lag. And actually, particularly in the little finger I found, but nevertheless, if they're poorly applied, you can be wearing a mallet splint, but despite that, still have um, a degree of flexion at the IP joint, and sorry, at the DIP joint, and the tendon simply heals in an in a, um, um, elongated position. So question, um, the answer, the, the, the main difference between A and B, and, and I apologize, maybe XAB is not that clear, it's a bit small, but in A, the, um, the principal fragment, the main bulk of the, DI, of the distal phalanx is still congruent in terms of its joint. There's no subluxation of that compared um, when looking at that uh, against the head of the middle phalanx. Whereas if you look at um, X-ray B, um, there is um, subluxation volarly of the main fragment. And you can just see there is articular incongruency here. So actually B, I would probably operate on, probably with two K wires, one blocking K wire um, uh, dorsally, and then one longitudinal K wire to hold it in position then take the wires out later. So I would say, as I said, maybe not that clear on the x-ray and I apologize. And clearly, um, so the majority of patients who have a mallet, whether it's bony or soft tissue, it's normally a stubbing type injury rather than a crush. Okay, and then the last question then. Can I just add a point there? Oh yes. As we're having an imaging x-ray, imaging webinar. Um, I would um, recommend x-rays after you put the splint on, certainly for things like me, because as you say, they're often badly put on and often the position after splinting is exactly the same as before splinting, in which case the splinting is not going to do very much. So I pick up that point. So do you, do you so that's interesting. So you do you x-ray every mallet split, every mallet um, um, you will then x-ray in the splint? If, if it was a big chunk like that, yes, I would. And what, okay, so what about um, a soft tissue mallet where you're not necessarily sure whether or not you've got an extended position? I wouldn't. No. I trust the look of the finger. Okay. The therapist to do that. I think that's very sensible advice. Okay. okay. So here we have um, um, an X-ray on the left, and the questions are: This is a reverse Bennett's fracture. Uh, number B: The need for surgery often depends on how distal or proximal the fracture is within the particular bone, that particular bone. C, the mechanism of injury is usually a fall on the hand. And D, rotational deformity is, is very common after this injury. So in this, once again, there is one, in my opinion, correct answer and three wrong answers. <laughs>
Okay, so um, this time um, I, I would disagree with the answer here. So um, let's. So the first one, this is reverse Bennett. Clearly, this is actually a, a typical boxer's fracture. It's a fracture to the neck of the fifth metacarpal, whereas a reverse Bennett is a fracture subluxation at the base of the first of the fifth metacarpal. Um, I think that the question B is the correct one here. So the need for surgery often depends on how distal or proximal the fracture is. So a fracture, in my opinion, a fracture through the neck of the fifth metacarpal is rarely, rarely indicated. On the other hand, um, a sort of um, uh, an angulated fracture through the mid shaft through the diaphyseal region of the fifth metacarpal is often much more, um, um, surgery is often needed much more because what happens is um, because the, the um, injury is within the mid shaft, you actually get a much more volar displacement of the head into the palm. And what these patients complain of in the long term, not is not angulation, but actually it, or rotation, but actually it's the prominence of the metacarpal, the fifth metacarpal head in their palm. And because it's in the, every time they grip something, it's very prominent and it's painful. So the ones that I've had to um, do late uh, or even do, os to do osteotomies and maybe bone graft or um, and plate, they are the sort of the mid shaft fractures. So I think that the need for surgery does depend on um, how, you know, whether it's a mid shaft fracture or not. Now, the question, the uh, option C, I put that in almost as a joke, really, because of course, the majority of boxers fractures are caused by the punching someone or something. But actually, the number of times you'll get somebody coming in saying, yes, I fell on my fist. Um, so um, I think I would say they may say most of the time they haven't punched anybody, but believe me, they have. And then number four, I think actually, in my experience, rotation of, true rotational deformity is not common. You do often get patients referred from A&E um, to the fact that saying there appears to be some underriding of the little finger. But actually, when you examine them formally and you look at the other side, actually, when you look at your own fingers, there's often very slight underriding of your own little finger on your ring finger. So. I would say, in my experience, I'm not often doing things because of rotation of the, you know, considering how many box of fractures we see, I think it's not that common. So, you know, I may be told off and saying, actually, I don't, don't agree with you. But in my opinion, um, it's, it's, it's part B that's the correct one. Any comments from the rest of the panel? I agree with that last point. I'm forever being sent these fractures in query rotation, and they rarely are well rotated. Okay. Another imaging point, you made it before, a true lateral will actually show that the angulation of the shaft is often much more than it actually looks on, on the bleach. And as you say, patients don't like that. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Emma. Thank you, Jeremy. Right, I'm going to move on and Moving on from fingers and long bones, talk about a couple of things about the imaging of the wrist, by which I mean the carpus and the distal radius. Try to get that one. This. You're probably getting a bit bored of this slide by now, uh, but we are trying to make a point. <laughs> and repetition is the key to good education. <clears throat> um, you all know these parameters. These are the things that uh, all the textbooks show, uh, the, the different angulations and the different uh, heights that one should aspire to when putting a distal radius back to a normal shape again. So when we reduce our fractured wrist, this is what we're looking at, okay? So it's conveniently that the tilt is about 22, the slope is about 22, and the tilt in that direction is 11. So 11 and 22 are most things. The other thing that is much harder to look at on a radiograph, but is quite important in terms of fractures, is the shape of the joint to step off okay and let me take a pointer one way you can look at what's going on in the joint itself 
is to take the lateral like this rather than the plane lateral. And this may seem to be going completely against what we just said about orthogonal views. But if you tilt the wrist, and this is actually more easy if you're doing it yourself with an image intensifier, and actually take a tilted actually right down that tilt, you can get an idea of what the joint surface itself looks like. And that's particularly important if you've been putting screws around there and you might see screws sticking into there. Okay. Another thing that's not often talked about in terms of assessing a, a wrist fracture after you've fixed it or after it's healed, if you leave it in dorsal tilt, you may end up with this pattern, which is often called adaptive instability, or even more confusingly, a static instability pattern. Basically, you've tilted the crystal radius backwards, so the lunate tilts backwards as well, and sits in a, effectively a dizzy position. But not all wrists. Some wrists will seem to compensate, and the lunate will tilt back into a more normal position in relation to the rest of the carpus. So I refer to that as intracarpal adaptation. And I think that's very predictive of who will do well and who will do badly with a malunion. If you leave someone with this instability pattern, they generally will have a weak grip and lack of range of movement. But in a lax individual, they can adapt to that. These are the people who often sort of elderly ladies come back six months later, their wrist is slightly strange shape, but they're functioning perfectly well and they don't want to do it anymore. So don't just look at the standard things, look at what the carpus itself is doing on the x-rays. These two things, that's what I talked about, carpal alignment, but radial shortening is said to be one of the best predictors of a poor outcome after a dispatcher. Both these are seen on plain x-rays, so you don't need any fancy imaging, and uh, that can give you an indication of how well you're The other reason that x-rays are important in, with wrist fractures is almost every classification system there is, is based on plain radiographs. <clears throat> it happens to be the EAO system, but all the other ones use x-rays as well. So that's distal radius fractures. I do tend to call them wrist fractures because they do often involve carpus as well, as I'll explain. They also can involve other fractures as I pointed out before. We've mentioned the importance of having standard x-rays, uh, PA lateral for a wrist, but there are a lot of situations where we use very specific x-rays, but common being in scaphoid. These are the uh, four series that they take in our hospital, PA wrist, oblique, lateral, and then the PA, this is the funny scaphoid view, on the deviation of 20 degrees tube angulation. So that's basically the tube itself is angulated. Now, there are slight variations on these. So if you're asked this question in an exam, make sure you know what's done in your own local hospital and then justify it. There are a whole host of very specialized views that have been described for various different things. Uh, this particular supernatus oblique view, um, you can see the proximal pole of the scaphoid on it, supposedly, but I think this is a view for the is a triquetral joint. That joint you can damage or get arthritis in, which can be a, a rather occult source of pain on the other side of the wrist. And this view might actually reveal what's going on. So, as I said before, this is the wrist that looks wrong. There's something going on with it. I'd just like to say a few words about imaging and what you look at when we're dealing with dislocated wrists. You might have heard of galula arcs. This is just a way of describing what you should see on the normal x-ray. So you've got a smooth curve in the radiocarpal joint here, and another smooth curve in the mid-carpal joint. You all know that the, the carpus actually works as a ball and socket joint. And most of the movement happens in the mid-carpal joint, which is why that curve is important. With this dislocated risk, clearly these lines are broken. You can't do it all smooth. So I try to simplify the whole concept of carpal dislocation. There's an awful lot of complicated stuff talked about it. So if you look at the x-rays and carefully 
question by question, analyze it, you'll get some idea and a sort of useful method of describing what's actually going on. So the lunate is the key to these things. Most of them, the lunate remains in the radius. In the more advanced dislocations, the lunate itself comes away from the radius. Those are two key concepts which you see on the lunate. Another concept is when only the ligaments are torn, and that's been described by Mayfield, a series of one to four. There are variations on that that can involve those as well, but essentially you can think of ligamentous injuries and ligaments. That's the whole Mayfield series described. I would now, but if you want to look it up, there. So this is the Mayfield series, essentially it describes an injury pattern going right around the lunate in stages and eventually the whole lunate is separated from the rest of the wrist and ejected. So the point about the imaging, in the first stage where just the scapular lunate ligament is damaged, the lunate will tilt and you get the so-called dizzy deformity dorsal integrated segment instability pattern. That's a stage one they feel. Just that looking up. So this tilts in relation to the skateboard. The clenched fist PA, take that by clenching the fist, you're putting stress between the, the skateboard and the lunate, and that will force them apart if the ligament's gone. England, that's called a Terry Thomas site. This is Terry Thomas from the English actor. There are various other famous people across the world with similar gap tooth, and so it's known by different names in different parts of the world. By the time you get uh, Mayfield 2 or 3, then the ligament on both sides of the lunate has gone. If the lunate hasn't dislocated, then you may actually, on a lateral x ray, just get a normal look at you, either get dizzy nor busy. In rare occasions where you get a lunotriquetral injury, but not a scapular lunate injury, then you get a dizzy deformity, the opposite of a dizzy lunate tilts downwards rather than upwards. When the injury has gone all the way around the lunate, it gets dislocated outwards, and then the lunate is no longer in relation to the these are other terms you may come across, greater arc injuries and lesser arc injuries. They sound complicated, but they're actually really simple. Lesser arc injury is just what I've described. It's when it's purely ligamentous. Greater arc injuries we have. It's a similar pattern to this, but rather than just going through the ligaments, the injury line goes through various bones that have various patterns of these. So this is the Mayfield series. This is the lesser arc basically described in the Mayfield series, going around the lunate, and this is a greater arc injury where you have similar transmission of force and injury across the wrist, but it can go through carpal bones and you get combinations of these things can also go through the spinal cord as well. So it's been described five types of peridomate dislocations, uh, and we'll go through these. So, Go back. Transcapoid perilunate, perilunate, transradial styloid, transcapoid, transcapoid, perilunar, lunate dislocation. I've repeated that because I'm now going to ask for questions. So, any guesses to what's going on here? You can put it in the chat. I mean, someone might come up, but I can't see it. Okay. So, anyway, for those who notice it, there's a fracture there. That's the scapoid. So, Actually, across the skateboard. There's nothing else going on. So, this is apart from the fact that it's dislocated, but the lunate is still in contact with the radius. So, this is a trans scapoid perilunate. Next one. Feel dislocated. Lunate's in contact with the radius. But there are no fractures. So, that's a simple. In the vertical commas, perilunate dislocation. 
Yeah, lunate has come away from the radius. So this is very least the Mayfield 5. Five and five and five. Now this is a slightly more complicated one. You would see the fractures. So there's a fracture and scaphoid there. So this is a trans scaphoid. You also notice that this should be fine. This is actually the articular surface of the catheter. That's halfway down the catheter. This whole thing is flipped around, and the catheter itself is fractured in two. So this is a transcaphoid, transcapodate fracture. I haven't got the lateral, but it does show that essentially this is a wrist dislocation. Uh, transcaphoid, transcapodate, which is sometimes known as a scaphocapodate syndrome. Right, finally, how would you describe this one? Speak to yourselves for a moment or two. And try and work out what all these bits are. So, the lunate, that's the lunate there, clearly come off the radius. So it's weak dislocation. That bit there, actually what would have been in that hole there, that's the proximal pole of the scaphoid. There's also a fracture here. And that's the trans scaphoid, trans thyloid with a dislocated lunate. All of these classifications ones that don't fit into them. So this is a combination of the above five. But the point I'm trying to make in this talk is these are quite clever diagnoses to get made, but you can make them just by careful examination of the plain radiographs and by having a systemic way of going through them. Um, they're not all quite as obvious as these examples I've just given. Uh, sometimes you do need, or it's useful to have more advanced imaging such as MRI to confirm what you think is going on and can help and we'll hear more about that later. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments from my colleagues? Right, well, if we can move on, um, Dr. Danica's second talk now, we're looking forward to. Right. Do you see? Hello? Hello, yeah. Yeah, can you see? Uh, we haven't seen your screen yet. Yeah, no. Where are we getting there? We're there. Excellent, thanks. All right. Yeah, so this is uh, actually um, about uh, radiology of late presenting uh, hand fractures. So how late is late? Uh, it's a bit uh, debatable concept. Late is relating. Um, mainly because it depends on the fracture characteristics. Uh, some fractures may tolerate, you know, present a little bit late and still, you know, do well with the intervention. And also depends on bone behavior, patient factors, you know, whether their bones, how well they will heal and that sort of thing. 
and also non surgical interventions and in this part of the world uh, some people go to native physicians and get treated um, which makes uh, this is this all non surgical it makes uh, matters much worse than just uh, waiting for a few weeks and coming to us so all these things uh, matter and it, uh, and it defines what late means also what is what is it that changes when a patient presents late uh, from a hand surgeon's point of view um, he saw her trend of thought uh, you know changes is affected you know you think differently when a patient presents late rather than you know, as a acute case and uh, the available options tend to Well, from a patient's uh, point of view, he saw her chances of satisfactory healing of the fracture is affected, and he saw her ability to return to pre-injury activity level also changes. So the natural history is such that you know this. This is the problem. This become this become sticky very fast. Um, it's a matter of days to weeks, and despite despite the slender nature of the hand bones, they become hard to reduce. We more often than not see these things happening, and they affect the joining joint alignment quite badly, limit joint movements, and cause tendon additions. So all these are challenges. Let's see some um, real world examples. And this one presented um, months later. I can't remember exactly the duration where she, uh, the female patient, didn't uh, turn up. I mean, didn't, didn't turn up at all uh, for treatment. Um, so as you can see, there is. Angulation and uh, maybe a bit of rotation. You see in the clinical picture better. And um, there's a bone spicule. This may be impinging on the tendons, the flexors. Yeah, it's this. The flexion was relatively okay, but extension was like this. She didn't uh, want this to continue. You know, she didn't like it, and it affected her um, functions as well. Even though this was a non-dominant hand, but this, uh, um, this, yeah. So this is actually like you know, she actually uh, took X-rays in the beginning, and then she vanished. You know, like uh, didn't come up. As I uh, mentioned, so you know, this would have been quite easily managed with maybe a couple of uh, interfragmentary screws. Mm, yeah, there may be other methods of management, but if the patient didn't present late, management would have been much easier because now at this uh, stage. We had to do the rotation and angulation correction, osteotomy, and plating. But if she presented at this stage, um, a lot of these uh, things could have been avoided, and mobility, uh, the difficulty of uh, performing surgery, all would have been avoided. Um, it would have been a much, you know, like would have been, I would say, it's a Piece of cake or something, but it, it would have been easier. Yeah, now this is uh, another one, a very small child, uh, maybe two years or something. Yeah, artificial injury. Now this one, say, remember, went to a native physician for some kind of you know therapy, which. Um, You know, didn't help naturally uh, because uh, they didn't care about uh, the alignment and they just applied whatever concoction on the skin. Um, so this one presented um, not very late, but 
but uh, later then I would have liked for the uh, baby to the child to come for treatment. The only thing uh, we could do at this um, state uh, or the stage was to um, realign the finger, you know, with a single um, axial K wire uh, with slight uh, dorsiflexion at the DAP joint. Um, that actually sorted out, uh, unfortunately, I haven't included the picture. That sorted out most of it, but then the, the final result or the outcome remains to be seen. Since these are, you know, late treated epiphyseal injuries, the, the finger growth is certainly going to get affected. So these are the issues of presenting late, um, especially with regard to this kind of um, injury. Yeah, so uh, yes, it is more of a uh, subluxation and dislocation is uh, there's a piece of um, polar lip fractured and it's uh, stuck like this for a few weeks. This was a surely um, a naval uh, soldier, you know, Navy person. Yeah. Uh, I can't understand. So he was anyway working um, with difficulty doing his um, security forces um, jobs um, and homework. This uh, without without, without uh, taking um, due attention, you know, without uh, paying attention to this injury, he had been going on like that for a few weeks. So it was actually, you know, we were wondering whether we could um, reduce this without uh, making osteotomy and shortening the bone. But eventually, uh, with open reduction, it was possible to reduce it and keep it in place, as you could see uh, in this, uh, in the, the rightmost um, X-ray, with, with a single KY. But the damage to the cartilage is, I suppose, already done. Um, the cartilage might not recover, uh, leading to early um, onset osteoarthritis. This is uh, a huge problem with regard to subluxations and dislocations. Uh, it's even worse than fractures. Uh, fractures, of course, uh, you could do things like derotation and uh, angulation correction and fix it. To a reasonable, you know, level or a standard, and get a reasonable outcome. But in regard to joints, uh, fracture subluxations, fracture dislocations, it's much worse in the recent late. And um, not only this uh, bony and joint component, there's a soft tissue component where the the ligaments, the collaterals, and so on are so tight and flexors are adherent. So this is not the end of uh, surgery for him. You know, he might need multi-state still. And uh, this was operated recently. Yeah, yeah and still uh, recently I saw him with uh, you know stiffness of the VIP joint even after KY removal. Now at the moment he is undergoing vigorous therapy, occupational therapy. Even with that, I don't expect um, the PIP joint to return to normal range, active and passive both. So I suppose he might need, you know, things like uh, manipulation and anesthesia, and flexatinolysis in future. So these are the travails of um, the presentations of fracture subluxations. Yeah, now this one. This one was um, a Ryan engineer in a, in a ship in, a, in, in, in Singapore. And he got this injury uh, inside the ship, but he came back uh, here like a week later. Uh, even week was um, like, it made things uh, difficult for us um, to you know, reduce this uh, fracture and keep uh, the fragments in place. 
So it was a lot of hard work. Yeah, this was a professional um, cricketer, the Sri Lankan cricket team. He got injured uh, very recently in, in Australia. So this is the original uh, picture of the original X-ray. And uh, what do you think? Does anyone want to uh, operate on this or not? Well, let's discuss later. Yeah, and uh, he centered um, like late. Um, he just had a you know like a basic splint on and uh, presented um, about think, four four weeks four weeks later in the state. This was taken about a month after. Now um, the question is, uh, if he presented um, early. Would I have uh, managed differently? You now I'll tell you what I did uh, in a moment. Um, so this one, what do you think? Uh, there is a bit of uh, anger and the excess and uh, like uh, this. These excess have this problem of you know like uh, not being properly you know like um, aligned. You know not true be you not know, true lateral. You know so one is a little bit of oblique view and the other one is okay. But there, clinically there was an angulation. I just um, didn't want to operate at the same. And uh, yeah, part of the x-ray is not seen. So we have it. So with, uh, with the correction of the angulation with the splint, um, this is after another month. And uh, I did upload, upload the video. So he had regained um, the functions very well, very well in the sense 80% of the flexion and extension, passive and active range of movement was already there. This is two months uh, down the line from the day of injury. And he's now back to practicing. So now this is uh, now. Uh, we would always think, you know, if a patient presents um, very early, we would uh, manage more aggressively and get a better result. Well, sometimes it is not so. Now, if this patient uh, presented within days, perhaps I would have uh, tried to, you know, like um, bring together all those fragments with a single uh, K wire horizontal and transverse. Um, and manage that way. Maybe it's, it's just uh, hindsight now. Um, but I think uh, since he presented late, you know, I ran out of ideas, sort of, you know, as I mentioned, you know, like my options are limited. And uh, then I just um, managed conservatively. I'm not a so much conservative surgeon. Usually I like. Action. Still, this one, uh, this was, so what I mean is sometimes it may be you know, better that some cases present late, late, uh, late in the sense, uh, intermediate. Uh, um, so that you may think differently, you know, like uh, differently, and that might benefit the patients. So, but, but I haven't done a, uh, done a, um, uh, this. Uh, Study, you know, where yeah, I would compare a case, a similar case managed um, operatively versus conservatively. Well, well, uh, yeah. well uh, this is uh, for me, this is a good result, you know, for a uh, presentation. So I'm just discussing various aspects of it, just uh, not wanting to commit. Yeah, this is the latest one. Um, I forgot to put that one. Yeah, there is only a very uh, small notch in the articular surface, as you can see, of the base of the base of the distal phalanx. So he might once again get early uh, OA, but functionally he's fine. Yeah, so this is what it means, you know. Um, Late presentations make uh, decision making tougher. Uh, 
whether to operate or not to operate, as I did last uh, during the, 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 with the last case. There I decided not to operate. But then once again, uh, your operating technique, if you decide to operate, might be affected or most likely will be affected when they present late. You know, certain techniques uh, may not be appropriate. And once again, this uh, question, the third one, when to operate. Now, even if the patient presents late, sometimes I might not um, want to, you know, offer immediate surgery. You know, I might just want uh, to heal the way it is healing and do a secondary correction like what I did for that um, lady with um, um, condyle fracture, you know, that malignited, and then did a secondary correction, you know, correction uh, of steroidal and fixation with plates. So these are the thoughts um, behind uh, late presenting hand fractures. Uh, so there are many ways of uh, thinking about how to sort out this problem. It's up to the individual surgeon. But one thing is sure, late presentations um, make things complicated for the surgeon as well as um, the patient because it becomes a you know, like, um, bigger, bigger problem. Bigger problem with um, many more problems as well as solutions um, as opposed to a fresh fracture uh, subluxation or fracture subluxation. Yeah, this has jumped. Yeah, this is what I did for that uh, engineer because I couldn't uh, put all uh, pieces together with uh, ordinary, you know, T plate or H plate or anything like that. So I used uh, a cage plate. This is not rigid fixation, but luckily this is locking. So it offered some um, support, you know, uh, that allowed me to mobilize the uh, yeah, and that sort of thing. There was a small fragment, I have included that. Yeah, so that's it. See you once again. These are my contact details, email addresses. Mm, yeah, thanks. Any questions? Dr. Damaka, thank you for that. That's, it's a really interesting subject. And as you say, now and again, nature teaches us that we don't have to interfere straight away. But the yeah. problem is, is to know at the beginning which ones we could get away with and which ones we can't. Yes. We're all still learning that. Does anyone else have any comments they want to say? Um, just to say, and I'm sure you'll say the same, but in these late ones, in general, it's better to have no metal work in and do nothing, in general. I mean, the ones that have done worse, I may make an x-ray look quite nice, but actually, um, I learned to my cost after being a consultant, when you think as a consultant, you can fix anything and everything when you're in your first few years, and actually you start operating less and less as you get more senior. That would be my message. Yeah, that's... That's uh, quite acceptable, and I would also agree. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. We can always make things worse. Right, well, um, the next on the agenda is Neil Liffin's ultrasound. Now, this is all recorded. Neil introduces himself very nicely. He works with uh, West Suffolk with um, Elliot and myself. Yes. And uh, Emma's going to play the video for us now. Hello everyone, my name is Neil Wolfen. I'm an MSK sonographer based at the West Suffolk Hospital. I've kindly been asked to present on the MSK diagnostic ultrasound component of the webinar. So I can appreciate most of you have got slightly different skill sets in terms of your ultrasound training. Uh, but today what we're going to look at is just the basics. So we're going to look at some of the key requirements of MSK ultrasound. Some of the features, some of the pitfalls, I'm going to look briefly at my scanning format. We're then going to look at some MSK appearances. We're then going to go through some pathology, just get you thinking as to what you see. And then we're going to cover some lumps and bumps and some intervention. 
So in the last 10, 15 years, the quality of the diagnostic ultrasound machines uh, has been excellent and it's still evolving. Uh, this little machine here is called a G machine. I use this at some of the hospitals and privately, and this costs in the region about 25,000. And the image quality of this is sometimes comparable to some of the bigger machines. This machine here we use at the West Suffolk Hospital, uh, and very, very good machines. So ultrasound, as we know, is very, very cost effective, and often it's used particularly early in various traumatic, inflammatory, and uh, degenerative conditions. So when we're scanning with MSK, it's important that we have a linear probe and ideally high frequency. This is a hockey stick. So this has a small footprint. This is very good for small joints, particularly of the thumb and the fingers. One setting that is a key component is power Doppler. So this is looking at slow blood flow, particularly in lumps and bumps and when we're looking for synovitis. In the last few years, we've had this new setting called Superb Microvascular Imaging, SMI, which is on the Canon machine, and this looks at even slower blood flow. Dynamic ultrasound is a key feature of ultrasound. Here we can see a trigger finger, normal tendon, bunching off of tendon, and a thickened A1 pulley. So using a panoramic view, very similar to our phones that we use nowadays for pictures, this is very helpful at times to look at the full extent of the pathology. Using ultrasound to compare one side to the other is vital at times. Here we can see this is the asymptomatic side. So this is the ulnar collateral ligament, which has normal appearances. And then we can compare it to the symptomatic side, which you can see this looks a bit like a sternal lesion. Um, at times, the differences is very subtle so sometimes it's very interesting to display a slight change in comparison one side to the other to, to help the clinician manage the patient in this view you're using a comparison to show the effect of compression on a lump using dynamic ultrasound is very handy at times in pressing or compressing lumps to see if they're solid or not. So some of the pitfalls of MSK ultrasound is largely user error. So we just need to ensure that we use the correct settings, making sure the frequency and the focus is at the right depth. Um, one feature that is a common mistake by the user is anisotropy, which we'll come on to shortly. The other thing is using too much probe pressure at times. So in this video, this demonstrates small changes in probe movement can make the tendon go from looking normal to abnormal. So in isotropy, you need to ensure that the probe is at 90 degrees to the tissue. So the probe here is in the correct position to visualize these tendons. But as this tendon nose dives, it picks up a darker area of the tendon. And so therefore you may be calling this tendinopathy or tendonitis. But what you need to do is you need to move the probe right along the tendon and then you heal the tendon in so the probe is perpendicular to this tissue. This video highlights the problem we have if you don't have a gel layer. So you, normally when you're scanning lumps, you need to have a gel layer, too much pressure, and you can see it compresses the blood vessels. So the requests we get in radiology vary, but normally they're very specific. However, when we're dealing with rheumatology referrals, these tend to be focused on the hands and feet. So at the hands and wrists, they're particularly interested in whether we have active synovitis, bone erosions, tenosynovitis, bony changes, etc. Uh, therefore, you'd have to scan every tendon, every ligament, every joint. So it's essential when we're scanning that we look at tissues both in transverse and longitudinal. And what we need to do is prove the pathology in two planes. So this is a tendon actually at the shoulder. So here we have normal tendon, but here we can see the tendon thickens out and we can see the texture of the tendon becomes a bit abnormal. And here we can see that we also have some abnormality. So this transverse is taken in this position here. So we can safely say that there's some abnormality in the tendon in its proximal 
region. So when I'm scanning the wrist, I would look at the dorsal side first. I would then look at all the extensor compartments, and then I'd look at the distal radial ulnar joint, and then the dorsal wrist. I would then look at the carpal tunnel, the Guyon's canal, and any relevant tendons such as the flexor carpi radialis tendon. I would then proceed to look at the base of the thumb. So here's the base of the thumb. This has a relatively normal appearance. And then we can see we start to introduce a bit of pathology. These are the little bony spurs called osteophytes. And then I proceed to looking at the MCP, PIP and DIP joints, both on the dorsal side and then on the volar side. So in determining what is abnormal, we need to know what is normal. So when we're looking at bone and joint, when we're looking at bone, we're looking for nice, smooth bone. And we want the bone to be nice and bright. We don't want fuzzy bone. If the bone is quite fuzzy and unclear, that means that the probe is not perpendicular to the bone. So we start to look at things that are abnormal. So here we can see at the radial carpal joint, we start to see a bit of a fusion. We've got a little bit of roughness of the bone here. Same in this view, the bone is not nice and smooth. And here we can see that you've got a bit of a bony spur. So these are abnormality to the bone. So we're looking at osteophytes, enthesophytes, joint effusions, capsular thickening, etc. So bony erosions is a key feature, particularly for the rheumatologist, and this is where we have a slight depression in the bone. You need to prove this in two planes, as stated earlier. Also, we can see in this image is some grayscale synovitis. And when we put the power doppler setting on, we can see that there's power doppler signal. Here we've got further bony erosions and we've got a correlation to x-ray. Looking at the bony surface, again, we expect it to be smooth. But as you can see, we've got a slight defect here and we can see other defects around here. We've got some periosteal reaction. We've got some inflammation. So we don't see too many stress fractures in the hand, but we do in the feet. And they're always quite interesting, particularly if the X-ray is normal. Um, but we have to be aware of fractures in the hand. Volar plate injuries occur from hyperextension injuries. So here we can see this is the volar plate. This is the flexor tendon and this is the PIP joint. And here we can start to see abnormality. So it may be a little bit of pocket of fluid or effusion. And we can see possible revulsion fracture. And this is the volar plate sitting down here. There's similar, similar features to this image here. So the normal appearance of tendons, this is the image from earlier. So this is a nice image displaying the black and white linear lines. So this is normal tendon. Again, you need to be aware of an isotropy, which we can see here. So when we're displaying tendons, I always think about them being ropes. So this is a nice regular rope here. But as soon as we start to get some defects or some bunching, we're starting to think that there's some abnormality. So another common feature of tendons is fluid around the tendon. We call this tenosynovitis. So this is some subtle tenosynovitis. We can see more established tenosynovitis here. And then we can see quite marked tenosynovitis here. And this is looking at a flexor tendon and it's got this sort of halo appearance. In this image here, we can see that there's abnormality within the tendon here. So this possibly is a split within the tendon or you may describe this as some defects in the tendon. So normal tendon here, but there's abnormality here. This is trigger finger. So we can see some abnormality of the tendon here. This looks normal and we can see some thickening of the A1 pulley associated with the tendon. So normal appearances of ligaments, very similar to tendons. They tend to see them attached from one bone to the other and generally have a homogeneous internal texture. And here we demonstrate the need for a hockey stick. Trying to get your probe right into the ulnar collateral ligament uh, is essential with a hockey stick. So in demonstrating abnormal ligaments, here we can see a ligament appears intact, but it has a bit of thickening and it has a bit of a defect here. Here, this is a ligament at the ankle, 
but it just demonstrates that the quality of the ligament appears to be abnormal and also some thickening and similar appearances down here. What is quite nice at times with the ligaments is that you can do a stress test. So like you would if you're a clinician, you would stress the ligament, but you can do the same thing under ultrasound to see if there's increased laxity within the joint. Other abnormality we may see, well, this is the ligament here and we can see a little fragment of bone. So this looks like an avulsion fracture. Again, using comparable sides, we can demonstrate that this is normal and this is abnormal. And similar appearances down here. So when looking at nerves, when we look in the transverse, what we see is like honeycomb appearance. And this is in longitudinal. This is at the carpal tunnel. And you can actually see that the transverse carpal ligament is here. And you can see that the nerve actually becomes a bit uh, compressed. So when we're looking at nerves, when we're looking for abnormality, this may be a key feature. But also if there's just some thickening of the nerve, um, sometimes you can get neuromas, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, etc. Et and we can also get some entrapments. So sometimes you can see a lesion actually compressing against the nerve. So the two areas we would look at the wrist would normally be the median nerve and the Guyens canal. Other appearances we see on ultrasound, we often get requests for foreign bodies. So this is a thorn and we can see a smaller thorn here. Sometimes these foreign bodies are going into the joints. Sometimes they're going into tendons or ligaments and causing big effusions. Other interesting pathology we see is sometimes around surgery. So these are postoperative screws here, and this is a extensor tendon. So sometimes we see screws that are causing a slight irritation to the tendon sheath or the tendon itself. And in a few cases, you often see a rupture of the tendon due to this mechanical irritation. So in these images, this is a, just a very brief overview of inflammatory changes that we may see. So here we have a double contour sign. So this is related to uric crystals, which can lay on the hyaline cartilage. So if you see this double hyperchoic lines here, that may be a double contour sign. We may see rheumatoid nodules. We may see tophus related to gout. We may see enthesopathy, so changes to the distal tendon. We may see bony erosions here. This is just a bony erosion that we quite commonly see. And then other features we may see are these grayscale synovitis, so capsular thickening, changes to power Doppler signal. And here we have some chondrocalcinosis. So these is little hyperchoic foci within the hyaline cartilage. And we also have a bit of a double contour sign here indicating some uric crystals. So I hope this is helping your understanding of MSK. What we're going to do now is look at some pathology. So I'm going to put, put an image up, have a look at the image for a few seconds, and then I will go through each image and, and, and tell you what I see. So here's the first image. This should be relatively straightforward. So this looks like the MCP joint. We've got some small capsular thickening, maybe a fusion with a bony spur. So this looks like a standard arthritic joint. Just from a ultrasound settings point of view, here we have some blurring of the bone. So this means that the probe is not perpendicular to the bone. So it is down here but it's not over here. So this means that the probe orientation is not quite in the right plane. Also, we don't have a gel layer at the top. So in A, this is the MCP joint. This has normal appearance, nice gel layer, no thickening, no changes to the bone. Here we have some thickening of the capsule, some gray scale synovitis, and maybe a little bony erosion. Putting the power doppler setting on shows that you have some synovitis. And here, this likely is the transverse image, maybe of this image. So this is longitudinal and this is transverse, again, displaying a bony erosion. So what do we see in this image? Well, this is the MCP joint and this is the extensor tendon. So I'll just give you a few seconds. <coughs> 
So sometimes this is associated with a boxing injury. So here we can see this is around the MCP joint, the extensor tendon here. And you can see that the tendon is located quite central. But here you can see thickening. And this is the extensor tendon that has come over to the ulnar side. So it's likely this is an extensor hood sagittal band injury. So a tear here, which means that the tendon gets pulled over to the ulnar side. So in this image, this is a ligament injury. So this is sometimes called skier's thumb, where people land on a outstretched thumb, causing a rupture to the thumb ulnar collateral ligament. And you can see here that the ligament is actually getting pulled away. So it's got no chance of being reattached here naturally. And this is because the adductor pollicis upon neurosis has pulled it back. So this is called a Steiner lesion. So we're showing two lots of pathology in this image. So here we have the base of the thumb. We have some bony spurs. We have a small bit of swelling in the joint. And then we have this lesion here. What we don't know is whether this lesion here, which looks like a ganglion cyst, is associated with the thumb, or whether it's associated with this tendon coming up here called extensor pollicis longus. So looking in transverse, we can see that the fluid appears to be around the tendon. So this is likely some fluid associated with the tendon. However, things are not always that simple. Sometimes we do see fluid that comes from a joint and comes up and encapsulates the tendon. So things are not always as straightforward as we've seen. So in this image, this is the PIP joint. I'll just give you a few seconds. So what can we see? So starting at the top going down, so we can see some fluid above the flexor tendon. There's possibly some abnormality to the flexor tendon. And then deeper down, we can see some roughness to the bone, maybe a bony avulsion. And this is the volar plate. And we can see some adjacent fluid. We have similar appearances on this image as well at the volar plate. And also at this one down here. So this is a tendon at the radial wrist. So this is quite a common pathology that we see. So this is decurvans tenosynovitis. So some thickening of the retinaculum at the first extensive compartment. And sometimes we see some changes to the tendon as well. So in transverse, notoriously, you'll see this darker hyperchoic region around the tendon. And this is good old trigger finger. So we see some abnormality of the tendon here, likely some bunching, and then we see some thickening of the A1 pulley. So this is the dorsal wrist, and here we have the fourth extensive compartment and a nice dynamic video showing tenosine bias around the fourth extensive compartment. So another tendon image, this is the extensor pollicis longus tendon. We can see some thickening and some defects within the tendon and then some narrowing. So this is actually a rupture of the extensor pollicis longus tendon and this is likely the distal stump. On this video, this shows some thickening of the flexor tendon sheath with some granulation tissue and subcutaneous tissue. And this is a post-operative repair which got an infection. This is another tendon image. And this was a laceration in the region of the left index finger near the MCP joint. This is the flexor digitorum profundus. And this is superficialis, which you can see has a thickened appearance. And then 
it appears to be missing some of the tendon. So this was a laceration that went deep enough to lacerate the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon. And this is the retracted gap of the proximal and distal stump measuring 32 millimeters. This information is quite important to the orthopedic surgeon who would be looking to reattach the two ends of the tendon. Ultrasound is normally an early investigative tool for looking at lumps on the hands and wrists. Ultrasound is very good at looking to differentiate between cystic or solid lesions. But if you have atypical solid lumps with vascularity, this is a bit of a concerning feature and further investigation is required. So it's important that you look at the clinical history and then you look at the characteristics of the lumps. So broadly speaking, lumps generally fall into three categories. So you have your typical simple lumps, which are non-concerning, things like cysts. You then have atypical lumps, which are non-concerning. And then you have atypical concerning lumps. So this is a simple lesion called a ganglion cyst. It's normally well characterized. It has a anechoic internal texture. It has posterior through acoustic enhancement. It is normally fairly solid, but the important thing is it has no vascularity. Locations that we commonly see is on the dorsal wrist, the radial volar wrist, and of the flexor tendon of the finger. This is a sebaceous cyst. We don't see many sebaceous cysts on the hands or the wrists, but to just give you a bit of an oversight, it has a well-defined border. It has a well-defined punctum, which connects to the skin. It has a heterogeneous internal texture. Sometimes they're partially compressible, but they can be solid. But they have uh, acoustic through enhancement and generally no vascularity. This is a lipoma, which we sometimes see at the wrist or on the hand. So these are normally oval lesions, well defined. They normally have a homogeneous internal texture with a spindle appearance. Sometimes they can be within the deep tissue or sometimes within the subcutaneous tissue. Generally speaking, they have no vascularity and are non-concerning. This is an aroma, which we sometimes see at the hand and the wrist. Common features of an aroma is you have a distal and proximal tail with a slight thickening of the nerve. So this lesion is adjacent to the flexor tendon of the finger. And this is a concerning lesion. So this has a irregular border. It has a heterogeneous internal texture. It is solid and has vascularity. This was later diagnosed as a giant cell tomb of the tendon sheath. But these are the characteristics that we don't particularly want to see with our lesions and need further investigation. This is a collection of complex fluid following a foreign body infection. And you can see that the fluid is well dispersed, has a heterogeneous internal texture and is likely to be compressible with some vascularity. This is a vascular malformation. Malformations are generally well defined. This has a homogeneous internal texture, but sometimes they can have a heterogeneous appearance, causing some posterior through acoustic enhancement. Sometimes they're partially compressible, and generally speaking, they have a proximal and distal feeding vessel. This was an interesting case we had in the last six months at West Suffolk Hospital. So what are our thoughts regarding this lump? So what we can see is that it's an oval lesion, it's well defined, it has a homogeneous internal texture, it has posterior through acoustic enhancement, which may indicate that it's not solid because we're getting some enhancement through the lesion. It's non-compressible. However, when we put the power Doppler on, we can see that it has some vascularity. So with this lesion, because it had posterior through acoustic enhancement, it had homogeneous internal texture. This could have easily slipped through the net. But the interesting feature on ultrasound is it had some vascularity, which was atypical. And therefore, further investigation of an excision biopsy was required. 
and it was diagnosed as a digital papillary adenocarcinoma, which is a rare malignant tumor of the sweat glands. It can, it can obviously present as a solitary painful mass in the digits of the hands or feet. So we're now going to look at some intervention. So when we're doing ultrasound guide injections, the needle has to come perpendicular to the probe to ensure that you can see the needle. So this is the needle coming in. Normally you put a bit of anesthetic under the skin and then you guide the needle into the joint and inject a bit of steroid and a bit of anesthetic. One of the benefits of doing intervention with ultrasound is that we can minimize trauma to the patient. So here we can see a vessel and here comes the needle and they're able to get it into this area here. So this is for de Quervin's tenosynovitis. Again, doesn't look like they've infiltrated the subcutaneous tissue with any anesthesia, but likely they'll be injecting some steroid and some anesthetic. And then this final video, this shows an injection for trigger finger. So when we're doing intervention, it's very important that we have some dexterity with both our hands. So holding the probe in one hand whilst injecting in the other takes uh, lots of practice. In addition, none of these probes have got probe covers on. I would probably not recommend that. A probe cover is normally recommended to ensure an aseptic technique. And this concludes my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've got something from it. And thank you for listening. Well, I found that fascinating and I learned something from it. I hope everybody else found it interesting. Um, are there any comments, any questions? Any questions? Actually, can I, can I ask? Um, Neil, do you think it would be? Do you, do you think there's um, room for us as surgeons learning this and doing it ourselves? Um, you know, sort of one-stop shop type thing. Um, I know that the shoulder surgeons, there's a number of shoulder surgeons, do their own shoulder um, ultrasound. Um, I have to say, it's not something I do want to get into. I must say, um, but um, do you think that might be an argument for doing that sort of thing um, um, as time, uh, you know, uh, um, as part of your training? Now, I don't sure Neil can answer questions, can he? Neil's not here to answer, but Elliot might. And Guy in the chat has asked exactly, or in the questions, has asked exactly that question, which is yeah. interesting. And certainly in, in other settings, I think it might well be a useful thing. They don't have as many trained staff as we're lucky to have. And Elliot? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's definitely a role. Um, I think uh, if you look at other specialties, you know, anaesthetics have done their own ultrasound for a long time, guiding injections. Mm -hmm. um, I know a handful of orthopods, uh, one who uses ultrasound to do Botox injections into muscles for um, chronic spasticity. Um, it obviously requires a bit of training. That, that, that's the thing. And so a lot of people think it comes very easily, but uh, it's one of, the harder one of the harder modalities to learn from the imaging point of view. Um, obviously, you'd already have the anatomy knowledge, so that's ha ha half the battle done, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not straightforward. I would say, and it does take quite a bit of practice and all the governance issues that surround it as well. If you do miss something or, you know, miscall something. Interestingly, as Jeremy mentions, 20 years ago, it was all the rage among shoulder surgeons to be doing their own, own ultrasound and stuff. Do they still do that? I don't think ours do really, do they? Do I suffer? Well, we don't, we don't hear, but they do, um, uh, I think in, in Len Funk does lots of that sort of stuff. I mean, I would say the one thing about ultrasound that, that puts me off doing it in shoulders, for example, is that at least with a MR scan, I can look at the images and interpret it. But actually, um, it's the one thing I, I can't look at a still image of an, of an ultrasound and frankly make head or tail of it, really. So, um, yeah. That's why, that's why I asked Neil to challenge us with those pictures. <laughs> he certainly did. <laughs>
I'm glad I was the last to comment. It's, it's not just a, a thing for orthopedic surgeons either. I think from radiologists, uh, we certainly struggle sometimes when we're looking at someone else's pictures with ultrasound. Um, and you, you are taught to take representative images, but it's, it's not easy. And um, I certainly know in the, in the States, they've got a different approach. They have sort of te- ultrasound technologists that will do the ultrasound and then a radiologist will then be expected to report on them. So they're, they're very used to doing that, but uh, not so much in the UK. Um, Well, that was interesting. Clearly showing us something that we orthopods have have known nothing about. It's good for us. So if we move on to um, CT scanning, and Melanie's going to talk to us about that. Um, I hope you can see my screen. We can, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, so thanks for BSSH and B first for collaborating with Sri Lanka Enhanced Study Society and organizing this webinar, I'll be talking about CT scanning in the hand and wrist. So I have no conflicts of interest with regard to the contents of the presentation. Don't make it bad. I take a sad song and make it better. Remember to let her into your heart. Then That's a little bit of history about the CT scanner. And since its invention in 1960s, it's evolved to be a very useful tool in hand and wrist surgery. And especially when it's combined with um, appropriate clinical details and when it's timed appropriately and also with objective assessments. It has sort of revolutionized our understanding with diagnosis, the surgical planning and assessments. And the tools we can use with regard to a CT are the multiplanar reconstructions, CT arthrography, dynamic studies, uh, metal artifact reduction protocols, and dual energy CT scans. Um, so we all know CT is best for bone morphology. Um, so it helps us understand the personality of a fracture, a presence of a fracture, and also help us assess and predict union or healing. And this, all this comes with a relatively low dose of radiation. Whoa. I think the, the colleagues from Europe are familiar with the left side situation, but from Sri Lanka, I'm very familiar with what you saw on the right side. So all these patients, when they have a, acute risk, they end, end up in the clinic and we see them. And one of our main concerns are in an acute wrist is scaphoid fracture. So the initial x-rays in scaphoid fracture can be inadequate with regard to diagnosis. And even if we can diagnose one, it can be in- inadequate for surgical planning and decision making. So one question we have is to when to do a CT. And my simple answer to that is do a CT when in doubt. So we can do a CT to diagnose a fracture. And if we have questions about surgical decision-making, planning, and also to assess healing. But if we look at the diagnosis alone, for scaphoid fractures, MRI has better sensitivity. But the point I want to make here is there are instances the MRI scans are not readily available. So CT is good enough in the absence of MRI, not too bad. But the most important a utility of CT scanning for scaphoid fracture actually is to objectively identify the angulation and the translation for surgical decision making and planning. So if we look at this example, the coronal and sagittal um, uh, the planar reconstructions, we can see that there's an undisplaced fracture here. But if you look at a second example where you can see the two uh, planar imaging, in the coronal plane, it's an undisplaced fracture, but when you look at the sagittal plane, it's the same 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 scaphoid, it is displaced. So that's where the CT, come, CT is helpful to define and understand the personality of the fracture. So when we decide to manage a scaphoid fracture non-operatively, it's important to have a, have a timeline for our expectations. So Ruby Gravel in 2013 looked at 220 conservatively managed scaphoid fractures and suggested that these are the time frames generally that they would heal. So the distal pole is about six weeks and waist fractures would take about nine weeks. 
and the fractures with comminution and proximal pole fractures would take longer. And if you look at this uh, sequential imaging, week one, we can see the fracture, and we, in week five, we can see the lucency around the fracture line, and then week 10, we can see the bony bridging, and in week 20, it's almost healed. But the question is, when we see a patient in the clinic, when do we do a CT scan to assess healing uh, for a scaphoid fracture? So according to Rainer Smith, our bony bridging at six weeks onward can be, can be a satisfactory indicator. So what we specifically look for is eight adjacent slices um, with 0.5 millimeter thickness having bony bridging across them. So that is a good indicator to assess healing in practical situations. So that's when we manage a patient conservatively. So how do we make our decisions for surgery? So again, um, Ruby Gravel's paper suggests looking at the CT scans, increased translation and humpback deformity makes your fracture prone to non-union. So this is the objective evidence that we can have, we can use to have a discussion with the patient saying that this scaphoid fracture has translated more than one millimeter and it has, it's angulated, there's a humpback deformity and there's comminution and it's not likely to heal when managed non-operatively. So when we make that decision based on our CT scanning, then that's the time that we start planning our surgery or templating. So we can use the CT scan to decide the approach. If you look at this image, we can see, we can have approach this fracture either from the dorsal side or from waller. And we can always plan whether we need a bone graft and the size of the wedge we need and whether we need screws, K wires, and how many screws if, uh, if we are using screws, or if it's too comminuted, do we need to use a plate? So all these options we can, can be planned preoperatively using our imaging modalities. But one of the most important things about having a CT in these instances is being able to diagnose, um, diagnose um, coexisting other injuries. I, so I think Jeremy mentioned there earlier about picking up the very subtle uh, abnormalities. So that's, I think, very important. So if we, so this was a scaphoid fracture and a distal radius fracture, but what we can see here is there is a wide scaphoid lunate gap. And when we look at the, the sagittal plane, we can see that there's a tiny flake of bone behind the lunate, potentially a DIC avulsion from the lunate. And also if we look at the axial images, we can see that there is an avulsion from the triquetrum, probably a lunar triquetral avulsion. So something that appears to be a scaphoid fracture becomes uh, with the appropriate details becomes a very complex uh, uh, carpal instability. So I'd like to discuss one of the patients so uh, that we had treated recently. So this gentleman was holidaying overseas, had had a massive perilonate dislocation, um, re fixed reasonably well by the local surgeons and came. Um, so we looked at the x-rays, pretty happy with that, like can't be very critical about the x-rays looking at that, but given the complexity of the injury, and uh, so we did a CT scan to see what the post-operative appearance is like. So again, so we could appreciate a wide scaphalonate gap here. And there was a bit of a concern about whether this screw is too long in the scaphoid. So we sat in a team and then decided, all right, we need to revisit this wrist because this doesn't look right. So and this was our arthroscopy findings. We could drive the scope right through the mid-carpal joint into the radiocarpal joint. And we could really see the well reduced um, the radial styloid fracture. And then we went hunting for that screw to see whether it's prominent. And yes, it was a bit prominent, a bit longer than we would like. So, yeah. So, and then what we did was we advanced the same screw um, and then fixed the scaphalonate uh, diastasis uh, using a suture anchor from where it was evolved, um, where it was evolved from the lunate. So that is how the CT scan post-operatively helped us manage this case. Um, and uh, let's move on to a different area in the wrist, one of the 
very common problems we, sorry about that. Um, one of the very common um, problems we see every day as hand surgeons. So we know with distal radius fractures, we have two categories of patients. So on one hand, we have little old ladies who generally has low velocity sort of injuries, extra articular fractures. Um, so can be managed with x-rays generally. But then on the other hand, we have hefty males after motorbike accidents having intra-articular absolutely smashed wrists. So, so the second category where the high velocity injuries are suspected, I think that's where the CT is helpful. Um, so let's discuss another case where CT helped us to change our understanding and plan of management. Um, so this was a 56 year old uh, gentleman who's had an intra-articular distal radius fracture fixed with a uh, bullet plate. And um, the initial x-rays looked satisfactory, but subsequently on serial x-rays, we could really see that the carpus is ulnar translocating, but we can't really see from plain x-rays as to what absolutely is going on until we did the CT. We can see that that volar lunate fragment is not contained in that fixation and the carpus is sublux volarly and ulnarly, which is um, which we couldn't which has probably not been predicted depending on the initial um, initial imaging. So so then we went back to the drawing board to understand what's the this I mean volar bottoms fracture and the volar rim fractures um, has different to the other distal radius fractures. So when the lunate facet is loaded, you have a volar button fracture. This is what we see in the CT. But what we don't see in the CT or what we don't appreciate probably is this little bony fragment has this short radial lunate ligament attached to it. And the short radial lunate ligament is massively important in carpal stability. And smaller the fragment, there's more instability. So this um, is an entirely a different kettle of fish to distal ray, normal distal radius fractures. The volar rim fractures behave very differently. And there's enough evidence in the literature to say that these are associated with more um, significant carpal instabilities and also has higher complication rates following surgery. So we can see that this was not captured and also it's not contained in this fixation. So in these situations, we tend to do CT scans. We have a very low threshold to do CT scans and uh, under, to understand the, the personality of this fracture to decide uh, the fixation. So essentially what we need to look for in the CT scans is this little volar rim fracture and go to the axial weaves to understand that this crescent shaped fracture, which is probably contains the, the short radial lunate ligament, you might also be able to see a little bony dust here, which potentially is the evolved um, long radial lunate and the radioscape capitate ligament. So the essential, the, the message is the injury is bigger than what we see. And this axial image of the CT is very helpful to understand this fracture and to manage it. So how has our practice changed um, uh, after seeing those images? So we tend to do more arthroscopy for these sort of fractures to understand the ligamental component. The second thing is we prefer to do um, a volar ulna approach uh, to access the volar ulna corner. So when you go radial to the FCU tendon, um, and release the Guillaume's canal and release the carpal tunnel, you can really see the entire ulna side of the radius and you can appreciate the ligamental um, disruption there. It's very helpful in complex cases um, rather than using the FCR approach and volar plating. Um, I think we have a lower threshold to go with this approach. So moving on to a different aspect of the wrist where CT is again helpful. So when we see a distal radial ulnar joint instability. So talking about distal radial ulnar joint instability, 
when we see this clinical picture of DRUJ instability, there are a few questions that run through our mind. Number one, is this related to the, the osseous component or is this, is this osseous related to the bones? So we need to then look at the sigmoid notch morphol, uh, sigmoid notch shape and how unstable the ulna head with regard to the, the radius of the sigmoid notch. So axial limbs of the CT is helpful. Sometimes we do CTs in um, supination and pronation, or we can also do a dynamic CT, which is a low dose um, CT scan where we can really see the movement of the ulna head uh, with reference to the radius. The second question is, is it, is it TFCC? Then of course you go for an MRI scan. The third question that runs through my mind would be, is the drug arthritic? So again, this axial weave and, and a coronal sagittal weaves of the CT scans would help us uh, pinpoint what the problem is. Um, so moving on to another risk condition, which is Kienbox disease. So <clears throat> talking about Kienbox, there are again, uh, for classification and management, there are three important aspects. So David Lichman suggests we need to look at the integrity of the bone, lunate. Um, Raina Smith suggests uh, that we need to look at the vascularity of the lunate. And Greg Bain suggests that we need to look at the articular surface of the lunate. So combining all three, we divide the classification and we decide on the management. So where the CT is helpful, is to understand the bony integrity of the lunate. We can, it's much better resolution and um, we can really see the um, intra, uh, intraosseous fractures within the lunate and the fragmentation, which massively helps with the diagnosis, classification and management. And um, yeah, so moving on to scaphal lunate instability, I personally prefer an MRI scan for scaphal lunate instability. But I can understand there are many instances where MRI scans are not readily available for wrist. So, uh, so this paper came last year, the, the interdisciplinary consensus on, in, of imaging on scaphal lunate instability. So they recommend that CT arthrography is very accurate for diagnosis of scaphal lunate instability, but I have, um, I have no experience using a CT arthrogram to diagnose scaphal lunate instability but apparently it's, it's uh, very accurate. And one final um, comment before I wrap up. Um, so what's the future in CT? So, um, so we can do dynamic CTs to diagnose and assess carpal instability. So this is when a patient is moving their wrist within the scanner. The scanner acquires that dynamic movement as a series of images and reproduce this videographic output. And what we've been able to do is um, generate these surface rendered models of individual carbon bonds and track them in 3D space and quantify their movement and how the joint contact pressures and joint loading changes in scaphalonate instability. So this is concentrated on the radial styloid where the degenerative changes develop and objectively assess the angulations and rotations and translations as a diagnostic tool. And um, yeah, so finally, I think our CT scanning is a very useful tool in hand and wrist surgery when combined with appropriate clinical details and when done in a timely manner and with objective assessment uh, uh, techniques, it has sort of revolutionized our understanding of diagnosis and surgical planning and post-operative assessment. Thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge Professor Greg Bain from Flinders University for sharing some of his slides and his clinical cases for this presentation. Thank you. Hi, my name that, that was great. Um, First of all, I have a question for Elliot. Um, when can I have fancy little moving CT scan picture? <laughs> I was going to say, I have not seen that before. Um, it would be nice to do that. Uh, if, it, Actually, if you can... Greg, Greg's been working on that for 20 years. Uh, oh, really? I remember going to the Hand Society there and presenting early versions of that, which were pretty stunning there. Good stuff. Um, I, I would actually make the comment that, that exactly as Melanie said, more and more these days when we see a slightly, even just a slightly complex distal radius fracture, we'll get a CT scan of the first. 
And it is surprising how many little sort of nasty bits like those sort of on the corners that you might see which, which show up. So it's a really useful thing if you have the wherewithal to really know what you're dealing with before you just open it up and bag a plate on it. Because that sometimes doesn't work. J Jeremy. Um, I have to, well, I think for me, um, one of the um, best things that happened that's happened in my 20 years as a consultant has been the um, ease of access to us being able to look at our own 3D um, models of CT scans, whether it's planning for shoulder surgery, planning for hand and wrist surgery. But in terms of planning for surgery in general, um, I think it is it's fantastic. You know, when we first started getting 3D reconstructions, in fact, you were given them by radiology. And sometimes they weren't necessarily what you wanted to look at or necessarily the right angle. Uh, but the fact we can now do them on our own sort of work state, you know, our own um, um, login, um, I have to say, I think it's absolutely revolutionized, particularly fracture treatment. Um, you know, it, equally planning for shoulder replacements, hip replacements, 3D CT scanning has been amazing. But some of those images, those moving images and those contact pressures, they're fantastic. Um, can I just quickly ask about metal artifact reduction sequence? Because that's something I still have. Um, I think it's quite variable in the amount of metal artifact you can reduce. Um, there's one particular one I'm thinking of. Actually, it's not for hand. It's for a shoulder replacement. I'm trying to revise her shoulder replacement. That presumably there is a, um, um, a, a sort of a, a maximum amount of metal beyond which you're not going to be, be able to reduce it. And presumably that includes something like the head, the metal head of a, of a shoulder replacement. I mean, or, or are there sequences that can reduce anything? I think uh, I think I would like to direct that question to Elliot because uh, my background is orthopedics. I think he would have a better better answer to that. Um, so I know about the availability, but about different protocols, my understanding is pretty limited uh, on metal artifact yeah, reduction. No I think it depends on the kind of metal you've got in there, um, because I certainly know with um, spinal work, uh, it depends on the kind of metal work that you have. Um, with, and we're similar with hip surgery as well. Um, whether you've got titanium or um, some people put ceramic in, stuff like that. Um, in terms of the amount of metal, I, I don't think there should be, if, just talking about volume, I don't think there should be a, a restriction on the amount of um, reduction that you can get out of that. Um, and the software that I've seen is pretty uh, impressive these days that, that, that reduces the artifact. But um, So, so we, 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 are you saying that titanium... Um, reduces better than something like yeah. cobalt, than something like cobalt chrome, for example. Yeah. Right. Okay. Exactly. I, I think it depends to a certain extent on on, on the metal that's used. Um, and as I said, off the top of my head, I, I wouldn't have thought the amount volume wise would, would have a would have a big issue. Um, right. Thanks very much. Excellent. Well, you might have noticed that several of us in our talks have mentioned that in the last result get an MRI scan. So hence the last talk is what we all fall back on and probably these days one of our favorite investigations. And Elliot's gonna talk, talk us through MR scanning. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Martin. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, we're slightly behind time, but I'm gonna try and rattle through this um, reasonably paced. Um, I'm going to discuss MRI of the hand and wrist, mainly focusing on the wrist. Um, there are a couple of um, hand cases that we're going to go through, um, but the majority of uh, things that MRI is used for it, it pertains to the wrist as opposed to the hand. Um, so, first of all, just to think about what an MRI scanner is, you can see it's a quite a complex looking machine. Um, Patients go into quite a narrow, we call the bore, um, and they're surrounded by a magnet, um, which then lines up all the, all the protons in their body. And then you have a radio frequency coil, which will fire in radio frequency um, and, then, and then pick up the signal that, that comes back at, as the protons return to their alignment with, with, with the magnetic field. Um, as I say, it's quite a narrow bore, so that, that, that can be difficult for some patients. Um, so have a think about whether they're going to be claustrophobic or have issues getting inside the MRI scanner before you, for, before you send them for one. And on top of the uh, coils that you have surrounding the patient, you generally use uh, a surface coil, um, and that's to increase um, the signal that you get back. 
Um, so within each of these devices, there'll be a series of more radio frequency transmitters and receptors. Um, and for the hand and wrists, generally they have, have a specific hand and wrist coil. And the patients tend to uh, lie prone with their sort of hand above their head, almost like a Superman position. And so obviously patients with a shoulder problem or uh, obviously more elderly patients that might struggle with that position, then you're not going to get as good signal. And you'll scan it with a hand beside the side of their, uh, their hip there. Um, in terms of pros and cons, uh, it's got excellent soft tissue resolution, and that's comparable to CT, where you kind of have a more average of grays between tendons and ligaments and fluid. Um, whereas MRI, you can you can um, play with your sequences in order to accentuate the differences between tissues. Um, you can do angiography, so looking at the vessel flow without contrast material. That can be useful um, for large vessels. Um, and uh, vascular malformations. Um, the smaller vessels, uh, I think as we discussed the digital vessels earlier, um, you're not going to get as good resolution for that as you would for a formal angiogram where you inject the patient with dye and then look at it under live fluoroscopy. Um, and then we've got some advanced techniques which can be helpful, not so applicable to the majority of hand and wrist imaging, um, but uh, certainly TWI is used a lot in the brain um, to look for strokes and um, abscesses and things like that. So it, it does have some applications which you can kind of pinch depending on what the question is. Um, the cons, we've already said it's got quite a narrow bore. Uh, so if you've got a claustrophobic patient, they might not tolerate very well. Um, it can be quite a noisy thing. If you've never been um, to the MRI uh, department, I suggest you go and have a look um, because it can be quite daunting. And especially once you get inside the bore, it's, it's even more daunting. And that can then have an effect on the quality of the imaging you're get, going to get. So uh, the more and more the patient moves or isn't isn't steady um, for the for the scan, then the the, more, the less good quality imaging you're going to get. Um, and it's time consuming. So you know we've got some of our sequences down. You know just to, just to two sequences um, for scaphoid fractures, for example. Um, but that that will still take probably ten minutes or so. Um, once they're in the scanner and there's all the prep work before and after, um, depending on what protocol you're going to do, with if you're going to look for ligaments, you might do some extra sequences and that can take even longer, up to sort of 20 minutes, half an hour sometimes. Um, it's more expensive than CT and X-ray uh, generally. Um, and you do have contraindications. Um, so one of the big ones is pacemakers. Um, more and more, some pacemakers are now MRI compatible but it does require a, a cardiologist to be involved and they, they, they can uh, deactivate some of the, uh, the pacemaker uh, material to then have the scan and then reactivate it once they've come out. And that, that's a bit few and far between. It's not come through very well yet to a lot of standard MRI scanners, but it is available in some places. Um, brain clips and foreign bodies can cause problems. Brain clips is generally a no-no. You're not going to want to put that in the scanner. And that's just because it'll heat and move around in the brain a little bit. Um, metal work elsewhere in the body isn't a big problem and implants aren't a big problem because they're so big and fixed that they, they, they don't move very much. Um, and usually it's the tiny little bits of metal that causes loads of artifact and actually the bigger pieces of metal don't cause as much. Uh, so into some sequences now. Um, and these will be uh, acquired depending on um, quite a few factors, but generally how long you wait between sending in radio frequency pulses and receiving them and how many how often you repeat them over and over again um, to build up a series of images and for the rest the majority of time we've got coronal images um, and it's it's quite nice to see the majority of things in the wrist uh, it's almost like a, a, a dorso palmar radiograph and um, so it's quite good to see the carpal bones and alignments some of the distal radius and distal ulna um, and we can see we've got a T1 sequence, which is usually very good for anatomical structures. We see that the fat is bright. So this is all the marrow fat and some subcutaneous fat. And most of the things are a mixture of gray and black then. So we've got a vein come over here and then we've got muscles of the hands. And we can see some of the triangle fibro cartilage complex coming in here, quite a low signal structure. And I'll just mag up there. And then, we, we, we use these quite a lot in this, in this hospital, um, proton density fat suppressed imaging. 
Um, and it's really nice for MSK imaging because it shows you, first of all, bone edema. And edema generally goes along with painful things. Um, so that kind of brings your eye immediately to where the pathology is likely to be. Um, but it also shows you cartilage pretty well. This is a slightly artifacty um, sequence. You can see they've moved a bit. They've got a pulse, bit of pulse, bit of motion artifact coming through here. Um, but you can see the gray cartilage of the scaphoid there and then the adjacent radius. Um, one sequence that some places will do routinely, but we, uh, we tend to drop most of the time is just a straight T2 sequence. So this is similar to a PD fat sat sequence, um, but we haven't suppressed the fat sat really. And so you can see if you've got some bright bone marrow edema in the scaphoid, you're going to see it a lot more easily on the fat suppressed imaging than you are on the, on the, on the, on the non fat suppressed imaging. So most MSK places now will trend, tend to drop the T2 sequence, try and go for a T1, a PD fat sat, T2 fat sat, or a STIR sequence are usually quite nice sequences. Uh, so earlier we uh, heard about what the surgeons want to know. Um, there's reams written about it in lots of radiology conferences. Uh, what do the radiologists want to know? Well, what side and does it hurt? Uh, and that's usually quite straightforward information to give. Um, if you can ask a question as well, so, you know, on the sided pain, question mark, TFCC tear, you know, that, that, that just directs the reporter and also the type of scan you're going to get um, to the appropriate type of imaging. Um, if you're worried about a scaphoid fracture, as I say, we tend to do quite short sequences for the scaphoid fractures here and just try and give the binary yes, no answer. It's a much quicker study. Patients prefer it. Um, whereas if, as I say, you're worried about a ligament injury, then we'll, we'll spend a bit more time trying to answer that question. Uh, so MRI can be used for a hell of a lot of things in the hand and wrist. And uh, we are going to go through a select few number of things. There are a lot more that won't be on in this talk. Um, so post-traumatic wrist pain is a good indication for MRI when we don't have a cause for it on the initial x-rays. Um, it's good for fractures and bone contusions and ligament injuries. Um, so that's one area that sometimes it's a bit better than CT with, um, especially non-displaced trabecular fractures, bone contusions, ligament injuries. You could argue CT would do reasonably well if you, you're going to do an arthrogram of the, uh, of the wrist. Um, as you say, fractures that are occult on radiographs, typically scaphoid fractures, but often a lot of other fractures in the wrist uh, because they're quite complex bones that fit together and the fractures are often quite small. They're very easy to miss on x-rays. Generally on uh, MRI, we'll see bone marrow edema as being sort of diffuse high T2 signal and low T1 signal. And the fracture, if we are, if there is one present, will be a generally a, a low signal line on, on both those sequences. So here we have a scaphoid series. Initial x-rays reported as normal. And then the MRI we performed, which demonstrates a very clear line through the middle, the midpole of the scaphoid there, this through the waist. And then you can see the smudgy edema around it in comparison to the capitate, for example. And as I say, usually I'll look straight at the PDFS to start with, find out where the bone edema is, and then look for any line in the middle. You don't always see the line as well on the PD fat sat or T2 fat sat, um, and normally that's where the T1 comes in handy. Uh, and if we look back at the X-ray, we wonder if we can see it on any of the, any of the uh, views. This was actually a follow-up 14-day uh, X-ray, and I think you can just about start to see some sclerosis coming in here, um, but certainly nothing that's displaced. And then I think this uh, case actually had some follow-up MRIs uh, to see if it was healing. Um, I'm not sure we would do that so much anymore. We'd probably follow it up with X-ray uh, just to see if there's any displacement. But we can see that the line just gradually disappears with time on the T1 sequence. Another wrist pain after trauma. X-rays uh, weren't particularly exciting. Usually it's the radius that we've missed something with, or the scaphoid. Uh, in this case, if we just zoom in here, we can see scaphoid looks okay. Just under the thumb, we've got trapezium bone edema. Uh, 
And if we look at the C1, bone edema again, and then there's a very fine fracture line coming through the ulnar aspect of it here. And this is where the sort of capsular attachment comes in, the, the collateral ligament. So it's probably avulsed it, but not significantly displaced it. And again, I think we would struggle to see that on X-ray. We're looking up in this region. Again, no, nothing convincing, I would say. Another scaphoid series. Question mark red. The radiographers in uh, a lot of places in, in the UK, I'm not sure about Sri Lanka, um, if they see a potential fracture on an X-ray, they'll, they'll put a, what's called a red dot. Um, next to it, and that's to alert the ED clinicians that they, you know, there might be a pathology there. Because often the ED uh, referrers are not necessarily trained at looking at X-rays, particularly. Um, sometimes there'll be uh, nurse practitioners, and uh, I think working with the radiographer's knowledge is quite helpful. So they've wondered about that tiny thing next to the scaphoid. MRI. So. Coronal sequence, we're coming through the flexor tendons here, so carpal tunnel region. We can see some bone edema just at the, the hamate, the hook of the hamate. And as we come to the axial sequence, we can see there's that fine line with a little bit of residual edema. I think this was a, a bit down the line from the original injury date, um, but just a nice example of a hook of hamate fracture. I'll explain the symptoms. Again, you'd be very, doing very well if you saw that on the x-ray beforehand. Okay, on to ligament injuries. In general, ligaments are sort of low T1, low T2 signal structures that join the bones. Um, there are quite a lot of them in the hand and wrist, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, so we try and focus on the ones that uh, cause significant disability and the ones that can actually have some management plan uh, if they are disrupted. Uh, disruption is basically a loss of continuity of the ligament. And the secondary signs are the, the important things, really. Uh, and we've already seen some ligament injuries today. So coronal T2 or PD fat sap and axial PD fat sap. You can see there's fluid filling the gap between the scaphoid and the lunate, quite a decent sized gap. And we see just this low signal structure, which appears to be flapping between the two. Um, and then here's our axial sequence. You can see a little bit of irregular stuff here and just that really sizable gap. Really. The x-ray beforehand were already suggestive of that, but sometimes a bit uh, underappreciated. We've definitely got some lengthening of the scaphoid here and a decent sized gap. And then I've put another slide in here, but this can be quite a difficult uh, measurement to take sometimes because you're trying to figure out where the scaphoid is and where the lunate is but generally try and find the long axis of the lunate draw a line across that and then the scaphoid is normally the tricky one to, to find but if you can take away the pisi form just imagine here's the palmar aspect of the scaphoid it does start to disappear over here but we can just about see some cortex coming back here and then you can follow it follow it around the back there and this angle is definitely very high so we're talking up limits of 60 and that was 86. So here's a, just a render of the scaphoid ligament. It is this U-shaped structure. The dorsal aspect does most of the work, and you can see it's a bit thicker than the, the volar aspect. And here we have some examples of normal-looking scaphoid ligaments. And another abnormal scaphoid ligament. And this one's probably got some scaphoid advanced collapse change going on. You can see bone edema in the distal radius, scaphoid lunate. Um, and so they've got degenerative change there, wear of the cartilage, subchondral changes. You can also note that the distal ulna has got this cyst and there's probably going to be some degenerative TFCC change slash tearing going on there. Just a note about the number of ligaments. This is just a render of the, the volar aspect of the wrist. There are obviously more on the dorsal aspect of the wrist, but there are a lot of things to look at on MRI. Um, and the majority of time we don't spend spend a lot of our time looking for every single one and making sure it's intact because it's not significant. And if it is, uh, you'll see secondary signs, but this is that scaphoid ligament. And you can see TFCC nicely. So on to abutment syndromes and arthritis. So ulnar carpal abutment, 
uh, it's a condition associated with positive on the variants. Um, as a result of that, you get a TFCC tear, and then you get overload on that side of the, of the wrist, and you get on the sided wrist pain. Uh, you will see arthritis as a result. MRI on, as we said already, arthritis, you lose that intermediate, intermediate signal gray cartilage, and then you get subcontral cysts, sclerosis, and osteophytes. And uh, as previously noted, x-rays do tell a lot of, of what's going on before the MRI. So I very rarely would go to MRI unless they've had an x-ray first, because that most of the time will, will nail, nail the question. Just a couple of cases now, hopefully these load. So the site is very good if you haven't seen it already, uh, Radiopedia. First of all, we'll have a look at the X-ray. We can see slightly positive on the variance. And then we have this cyst that's formed in the, in the lunate. So you can, you can bet your bottom dollar there's gonna be a TFCC abnormality there and associated cartilage thinning. And then here we have another case of an MRI this time. We have our chrome T2 fat sat this time. Instantly, we see bone edema in the lunate. CFCC looks certainly very thin in that area and completely deficient just here. And then back again, we start to see the TFCC looking intact. And sometimes this is the way it'll be. You won't, the cartilage actually looks pretty good there. But in order to get bone edema in, in the lunate, there's going to be some irregularity and some defects. But we are talking about something that's probably less than one millimeter thickness there. So MRI does sometimes struggle with, with, with the resolution in very thin cartilage. Uh, this is just a normal PD coronal. We don't seem to have a T1 on, on this sequence, but that, that would have been quite nice as well. Keenbox disease. So this is a lunate osteonecrosis, uh, usually related to ab abnormal vascularity of the lunate, um, whereby the lunate slowly gets uh, necrosed, fragments over time, and then collapses, and then you get the secondary degenerative changes. Uh, this is associated with the opposite, so negative ulnar variants. Um, and again, secondary signs are important, so we can often pick those out on the x-ray before we come to the MRI. So occasionally, the x-rays are normal in the very early stages, and you'll just see bone edema in the, uh, in the lunate. So here we have sclerosis of the lunate, negative ulnar variants, not particularly subtle, but uh, you can see that being overlooked. And then we come to the MRI. So this is what I mean by, you know, probably too many sequences. Uh, you, can you can certainly shorten this protocol and probably answer most of the questions you need to. And as I say, you can kind of guess what's already going to come once you've seen that x-ray. There's going to be bone edema in that, in that lunate. Looks flattened. This doesn't look as good quality MRI as the previous. Uh, depending on the strength of the scanner and the, the setup, uh, you don't always get uh, such good MRI, MRI pictures. But there certainly looks to be some fluid in the joint here as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if they got some secondary effusion and synovitis related to that. And then one final case on that. Much more flattened appearance. You can imagine there's been microfracture and actual macrofracture going on there. Probably some secondary degenerative change. As I say, most of the information you can gather from the X-ray, and the MRI has just confirmed those findings. The cartilage can be a bit unreliable on the T1 sequence, so I would always encourage you to look at the PD or the T2 sequences. And depending on the plane you get, so here we have two, three coronal sequences. A sagittal sequence would have been quite nice through this. You would have appreciated the volar aspect of the fracture a bit better and any rotation that's going on there. 
Okay, so on to some uh, questions quickly. I don't know, Emma, if you have the uh, quiz box that we can get. I, I do have that set up, yep. Perfect. Do you want to go to that slide first and I'll, I'll, I'll share it? Or do you want to sh I share it now? Yeah, if you share it now, because I think if, if you've got the answers on that, cool. on that, you should be able to see it pop up. There we go. So I'll just go back to the images. So please vote. Okay, very good. So, yep, ganglion cyst is the correct answer. Let's we'll start off with the x-rays. We can see this is quite a degenerate looking wrist already. So radio scaphoid joint looks pretty degenerative. Try scaphoid joint and third, sorry, second carbonate carpal joint. Very abnormal looking. And this was an x-ray that was, I think, a couple of years before the MRI. So you start to see this lucency already coming in the bone here. And I suspect if we re-X-rayed them up to date with this MRI, we would see even more coming here. So the MRI, we have T2 fat sat sequences, which show this very high signal lesion throughout the metacarpal. It's scalloped the bone, and you can see it's then eroded through the bone due to pressure. And as a result, you have all this fluid pouring out the dorsal side of the wrist. And so... The theory here was that it came from that very degenerate joint, constantly filling almost an interosseous ganglion into the metacarpal and then eventually decompressed dorsally. This is one we did give contrast to. We don't tend to give contrast much on MRI for the hands and wrists, but this is the T1 sequence. And we can start to see little bits of enhancement at the margins of this. No enhancement within the center of it. Um, if, it if there was, then we'd be thinking more lymphoma or GCT. Um, and we can see there's lots of enhancement as well with, throughout the wrist and further erosion and ganglion formation extending into the radius there. So this was thought to be a case of uh, CPPD that had uh, basically gone, gone wild. You get very classic geode sort of giant subchondral cysts with that. So um, even though there wasn't much chondrocarcinosis there. We have another case now. I don't know where the quiz box has gone. Here are our options. Excellent capitate fracture. Uh, this is another occult or missed fracture on an x ray, probably more occult, really. Some magnification there. So, in retrospect, you think hmm, maybe there's a little fracture line there. But if you were calling all of those, you'd be calling, over calling a lot of, lot of fractures on x rays. So, I think it's reasonable that we, we didn't see it. And then, then it went to MRI. This was a bit further down the line. We have sagittal, axial, and coronal sequences. Um, and I say further down the line because you can see there's cyst formation centrally. So whether this had a little bleed into the bone and then formed a cyst, lots of bone edema still around that fracture. No significant displacement we can see on MRI. And did they have a follow-up film? I think they did. And that just tells the story we already saw on the MRI. So cyst formation, sclerosis, some features of healing. Next up. We have a couple of coronal and sagittal image through the wrist. We have some options. Let's park on there. 
equal. So uh, de Quervin's tenus on the right is, is, is the correct answer here. Uh, I can see why you said scapular ligament, ligament tear, because that does look a bit irregular. And uh, this is one of the importance of MRI is that you do scroll through all the images and make sure they join up. And one of the limitations of trying to provide you just a few images. Um, but I will draw your eye to the, the first extensor compartment here. It can often be pretty subtle on MRI. And I think this one might've been missed by the original reporter. Um, we can see there's lots of stuff hanging around the tendons here. So here's the very black tendons and then this extra gray signal just hanging around it. So, and we compare that to the PD sequence and we can see there is edema surrounding that. And on the sagittal, it's tenus endovitis, but often there's not that much fluid. Um, it's a sort of stenosing tenus endovitis. So you'll have your extensive retinaculum coming over the tendon. And that is the thing that gets very thickened and pinches the tendons as they come through. And then they get very thickened and tendinopathic. And then you do get a little bit of fluid, but usually it's more striking. If you ultrasounded this, I think you'd see it very nicely. And some of these ones are actually a bit nicer to see with ultrasound because the resolution for such a superficial thing is, is very, very good um, on a good quality ultrasound machine. And then you can also guide injection therapy into the sheath. Occasionally, you see a couple of x-ray changes um, in, that indicate there has been some tenus on the I'm not sure if I overcall this, but sometimes you see a little bit bone, bone irregularity um, where that retinaculum comes over. Um, you can see this was red dotted. I think they wondered about a scaphoid fracture on this one and, and, a, and a radial styloid. And then we have one, one final case for review. Sorry, if you could just uh, show the options. Thank you. Okay, yeah, good majority have it, ECU subsheath tear. So on the axial sequence, it's usually quite nice to follow these, these tendons up and down. We can see the rest of the extensor compartments coming across here. And then here's your extensor carpial naris, which should be in this groove, um, but it's, it's hanging out the side. And that usually indicates that there's been a subsheath tear. Now we don't have great quality uh, resolution for these, um, but there's a lot being said about where, where it relates in, 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 in comparison to the, the actual sheath itself and whether, whether it's impinging it at all. Um, but we can see on the coronal that it's clearly away from where it should be. Here's the other styloid. There is some edema tracking around that. Um, again, quite a nice one to do with ultrasound. Um, and depending on which position they're in with, with, with the ulna and the degree of pronation or supination, obviously this, this moves around. So um, that's quite nice to do with ultrasound. You can do it as quite a nice dynamic test. Okay, thank you very much. There's a couple of websites which I find really useful. Um, and I would encourage you to have a look if you want to learn more about um, imaging of the wrist and hand. Brilliant, Henry. I thought that was fascinating. And as well, there's some great cases you've demonstrated there. It's really good. Um, the the other abutment, I, I particularly like that because as orthopedic surgeons, we have a really good operation that works for that, at least I think so. Um, something that actually quite interests me, can I just ask you a question about scapholunate injuries? Um, how good do you think you are at telling the difference between an acute one and a chronic one? That's a question we often get. We see someone just falling on their wrist, and they've got a scapholunate gap, and is it a new injury or is it just a gap that's been there for quite a while? And those we often do send you. I, I, I would say not good at all. Um, unless you've got those secondary um, advanced collapse changes, then um, we're, we're going to struggle with that. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it depends, I suppose, how quickly you get them in the scanner. You might see some soft tissue edema. Uh, and that's, I think, what we're probably thinking of when we send them to you. Can you see a sort of, sort of inflammation around it or sort of healing reaction rather than just the chronic change? Yeah. Anyway, that's I, just practical thing that we worry about yeah i would say we're, we're, we're not good we're, we're, we're no better than uh, than anyone with a magic ball jeremy what do you think <laughs>
Um, I think, um, you know, with the increased resolution in my lifetime of the MR scanners, I think that the um, the pictures you get are now really great quality. I have to say, when, when I first started, it was a bit blurry, I've got to be honest. Um, but I think the um, are these three Tesla machines, whatever they're known as, is that right? So they are, you know, they are, in fact, they are stunning. Um, they're stunning picture quality, really. So, I, you know, I use it, to be fair, I use CT and MR scan a lot in wrists. But like you, Martin, I get preferred patients from fractures and they've got, you know, wide escaping in intervals and you are really struggling at times to work out whether it's new or old. Great. Well, we've just about, we've had just slightly gone over our extra time as well. So I'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, they've been fascinating. I've certainly learned a bit, which is one reason I volunteered to do this session because I thought I might learn something. Um, and thank you for all the people who watched us. A fair few of you have made it right to the end. You will get your certificates. And final thing, don't forget the next one in about a month time on, on media nerves. <laughs>